The Appellate Division First Department is now in session. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Appellate Division's virtual argument session. I am going to begin by calling the calendar, so please listen carefully. People versus Simone Gardner for the appellant. Yes, Emma Schreister for the appellant. Five and one for the respondent. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jared Wolf with the people. Um, Five minutes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Real World versus Clark for the appellant. Jackie Aiello for the appellant. Three and one for the respondent. Mark Lane for the respondent. Three minutes. Thank Melody you. S is submitted. Santa Pau versus Bron Brownstone 2 Condo at L. For the appellant. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Joe McGovern from the firm of Wilson Elser. Oh, no. That's just a moment, please. Five and one. Thank you. Yes, you may proceed. I think it's Ms. Solari. Apologies, I just lost my internet. Lauren Solari on behalf of Rota Valley. Three and one. And for the respondent. Good afternoon, Greg Friedman for respondent. Mr. Friedman, five minutes. So that's five and one, three and one, and five. People versus James Chalen for the appellant. Good afternoon, Lauren Jones for appellant. Four and one for the respondent. Good afternoon, Philip Tisney for the respondent. Good afternoon, four minutes. FGLS Equity versus Sages LLC for the appellant. Russell Bogart for the appellant. Five and two for the respondent. Richard Yesco for FGLS. That's five minutes. G Builders versus Bondex. There's one more insurance. party on that, Your Honor. Oh, I'm sorry. For the um, for the the other respondent, please. Yes, Your Honor. For the intervener respondent, Mendelo Foundation, Richard Schaefer. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, three minutes. G Builders versus Bondex. Good Insurance. afternoon, Your Honor. Josh Wood for appellant. Your name again is Joshua? Re yes, Your Honor. Repel. Sure. That's five and one. For the respondent. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jason Bittiger on behalf of the respondent, Bondex and Companion. Five minutes, Mr. Bittiger. Thank you. People versus Rosalind Pilmar for Good the appellant. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Sam Talkin for Ms. Pilmar. Five and two for the respondent. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Susan Axwad for the people. Five minutes. Bloom, Bloomenberg, sorry, Bloomenberg versus Laura is submitted. International Pathways versus University of Queensland for the appellant. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Carmen Separic for the appellant. Good afternoon, five and two. For the respondent. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Lisa Bebchik from Ropes and Gray on behalf of respondents. Five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. People versus Jonathan Ramirez for the appellant. It's Brian Davis, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Five and one. Good afternoon. For the respondent. Vincent Revelisi for the people. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Five minutes. Coastal uh, Bennett. I'm sorry, benefits versus Naum is submitted. Swiss Gem versus M&B Limited is submitted. Jewish Press versus MTA. We have three different matters. First one. Uh, I'm, good I'm sorry, good afternoon. Helen? Joseph Aaron for, for um, Jewish Press. Uh, five and one for the respondent. Uh, for the respondent, Jason Douglas Barnes. Good five afternoon, minutes. Your Honor. Thank you. Five minutes. Jewish Press versus New York City Department of Investigation for the appellant. Joseph Aaron for Jewish Press. Five and five and one for the respondent. Amy McKempel for Department of Investigation. Five minutes. Jewish Thank Press you. versus New York City HPD for the appellant. Joseph Aaron for Jewish Press. Four and one. And for the respondent. Kate Fletcher for the Department of Housing and Press. Housing Preservation and Development. 
Thank you. Four okay. minutes. It's okay. U.S. Bank versus Stewart. The appellant is submitted for the respondent. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Andrew Bronstein for the respondent. Two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, counsel, please remember, as always, that we have your briefs, we have your record, and we are fully familiar with the facts of your case. So please go directly to the most important points that you wish to make. Also, as is customary, please don't speak when a justice is speaking. This is particularly important, of course, doing our virtual arguments in order to hear the questions that are asked. And finally, please keep your mics muted unless you are speaking. Uh, just so we can limit our technological issues here. Uh, and I thank you in advance for your patience and cooperation. First case is People versus Simone Gardner. Just one minute, yeah. please. Sorry. It's okay. Okay, you may begin. Good afternoon, Emma Schriefter from the Office of the Appellate Defender on behalf of Ms. Simone Gardner. Ms. Gardner was charged with two counts of gun possession and nothing else. The prosecution only needed to prove that she possessed a loaded and operable gun and that she possessed the gun with intent to use unlawfully. She was not charged with any crimes related to the shooting of Ms. Holmes or the resulting injuries. And yet- Didn't the Ms. testimony Holmes with regard to Ms. Holmes and the fact that she was shot in the leg um, put together the fact that this defendant was there and had the weapon. Um, I think beyond that, there were there was a video or a photograph um, uh, that showed what looked like her holding the weapon in a downward position. But didn't the testimony of the witness who was shot um, add reliable uh, evidence? I should say more reliable. Well, the evidence, the evidence or the testimony that somebody was shot and somebody went to the hospital, which could have been provided by an officer, of course, conceitedly is admissible. But the fact that she was jumped out of her seat, that her toddler was screaming, that her toddler had blood on him, none of that, that was all just inflammatory evidence. And the jury could have presumed or inferred from the surveillance video of that was allegedly Miss Gardner brandishing a weapon in a crowded area that somebody was shot, but the location of that wound was not relevant to any element here. This error. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. okay. The error was compounded by the admission of a prejudicial text message, which respondent concedes was inadmissible, but the text message only showed that Ms. Gardner had a propensity for violence and a propensity for possessing guns. Again, this uh, test of, uh, the testimony from an officer could have been admitted to say that somebody was shot, but it was purely inflammatory and the details of the nature of the wound, the traumatic experience of her son and herself were far from relevant and should have not have been admitted here where it did not tend to prove any of the elements of the crime. My adversary claims that the testimony was necessary to prove that the gun was loaded and operable, but the only inference that can be drawn from the testimony that there was a gunshot and that there were bullet casings found at the scene of the crime is that somebody possessed a gun capable of discharging a bullet. My adversary also claims that the testimony was necessary to prove possession, but there was a surveillance video that the prosecution alleged to show a black object. And to the extent the jury believed that this black object was in fact a gun, that was sufficient to prove possession. And again, the inflammatory details of the traumatic experience were not necessary. Counsel, this, the, what you say about the inflammatory details is separate than what you say about evidence that was um, helpful to the prosecution. I don't think they're limited by um, only a certain amount of evidence if they have evidence that's uh, useful to uh, the prosecution of the case. 
the evidence that she was shot in the leg was certainly not inflammatory. But perhaps just the testimony that somebody was shot in the leg would have been fine. But here it was the additional details which were not needed. We didn't need to know, or the jury didn't need to know that she jumped out of her seat, that there was blood on her son, that he was screaming. And all of that had did not tend to prove any of the elements here and were just inflammatory. It was further prejudicial by the fact that the prosecution highlighted her, her testimony on both summations and opening. And what should have been a case just about simple gun possession was turned into one where Miss Holmes was the victim of a violent crime. We learned- Do you, or do you, the have, very do you want to turn your attention perhaps to the sentencing issue? Yes, uh, Ms. Gardner, I, I request that there be a sentence reduction because the sentence of full four and a half years beyond the minimum is not justified by her criminal conduct, the circumstances of this case or her record. Her, her programming during pretrial incarceration shows that she's ready to make new life changes and be a productive member of society. She was an eager participant in mental health counseling. She took several courses regarding anger management. She engaged in vocational and education training. And all of this shows that she has the ability to have a successful reentry in addition to her employment experience and her vocational experience. Thank you. If Mr. Yes, you have a, a minute for rebuttal, okay? Uh, Mr. Walkowitz. It's good afternoon, Your Honors. Um, we would ask that this conviction be affirmed. It's, it's going to Ms. Holmes's testimony um, regarding. Well, it's not so much Ms. Holmes's testimony. It's the additional inflammatory aspects. It's not so much the fact that she was there and was shot in the leg. It's the fact that the judge had said not to add anything inflammatory. And there was certainly no need to know what her son said in the car or that he was crying or anything else. That didn't go to the fact that she was shot. She had already testified that and it didn't strengthen it more or less. Wasn't that inflammatory? No, And you not. can address the text as well, but I know you've already conceded on the text actually, so we can actually, you can leave that alone. Yes, um, with respect to the inflammatory aspect of how she was notified, um, she did testify. The judge essentially said, testify to, you were shot and he went to the hospital, as your honor just alluded to. The witness testified that she was shot and she testified how she would discover she was shot, which was she went into a car and her son drew her attention to the wound and she looked at it and said she was shot. Then she went to the hospital. She said she went to the hospital. Well, well it was more than that. I mean, you, you know that the judge has already limited the way the evidence should come in and instead she starts talking about my son was crying and screaming and this and that and the other. That's precisely the aspect that the judge didn't want to have to come in so that it wouldn't be inflammatory and lead to these questions we're sitting here addressing. Well, I, I think two uh, just if she had said my son called my attention to or my son said something, it pointed me, you know, I, I looked at my leg. Well, Your Honor, I think that um you know, it's not terribly surprising that when she was notified that the person said it in an excited manner. Now, obviously, Your Honor, you're right. It should have not, that should not have been said in the way it was said, but it was not, it was not, it was a human being testifying. It was not in contravention to what the judge was saying, say, the judge was saying, look, say, you could say that you were shot and that you went to the hospital. We don't want to talk about the injuries. We don't want to talk about, you know, what pain you suffer. We don't want to draw this into something that it's not. I mean, she just was explaining how she was shot. Now, in retrospect, looking back at it, of course, it might not have been the cleanest way in which the judge said she didn't want any nonsense, but I'm not sure that this was nonsense. It was a witness explaining what had happened. Um, and, and what I would say is, is that the people stuck by your the the judge's carefully crafted decision whether it was 
the perfect execution, I will concede that it wasn't the perfect execution. But it in because it's not the first time one sees a, a witness or hears a witness. Uh, presumably, the witness was prepped to some degree to the extent that her testimony was heard. But anyway, I think I have a question from Justice uh, Starpula. I wanted to address the um, defendant's argument that her sentence was quite severe. And she's, uh, you know, more severe than many we've seen under these circumstances. So I'd really like you to address that. She's a 38-year-old woman. She's been taking, she's been um, uh, in, while she's incarcerated, she's been uh, doing the right thing. So why, why this heavy sentence? Well, Your Honor, um, thank you for that question. This crime was extraordinarily dangerous. We were just talking about a young child who was there. This defendant took a gun in an open street outside of a funeral and blasted the gun off. That is indisputable. It could have killed the little children. And that is not an insignificant um, action. And of course, this was not the defendant's first action in terms of violence. She was part of a violent robbery in which the, the victim's face was slashed. She has multiple assault three convictions. She was, um, excuse me, she had an incident with her wife um, in which the defendant slashed her bicep and then fled and, you know, sent threatening text, um, phone calls or text messages cited in our brief. So this is not a defendant who, you know, she may be well doing good things and, and I congratulate her for that, but she definitely has a violent past with a violent conviction and it was a dangerous conviction. And that's why the sentence in this case, it's our position was appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Schriefter, you have one minute. Sorry, Sorry I Hello. had trouble on myself. Oh. Yeah, um, I see my that. adversary downplays the the testimony here. The this was transformed into a case about Miss Holmes being a victim, and it was not only the fact that she was shot in the thigh, the place of where she was shot didn't matter, but that she, quote, jumped out of her seat, her cell phone was destroyed, she had a hole in her pocket, and also that we that the jury learned of the background about her life. None of that was necessary to prove the elements of the crime. And as to the sentencing here, in terms criminal record and the violence of the crime, again, that is outweighed by Ms. Gardner's tremendous efforts during pretrial incarceration, specifically addressing her anger management issues that she did in two ways, both with a course and working directly with a counselor on this. And she has other um, she has other ways of showing that she'll have a successful reentry with her vocational skills and her employment history, which will be able to lead her back into a law-abiding life and have a successful reentry here. So I ask that the conviction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Real World versus Clark. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Jackie Aiello from Boyd Richards for the appellants. Mm -hmm. the, yes, again. Thank you. Your, uh, the respondent in this matter is a, a residential shareholder who has previously asserted uh, nearly two dozen um, individual claims against the co-op. And uh, several years, uh, that was filed in 2015, I believe, and several years into that litigation uh, filed a derivative suit, which is the um, issue it, at the, with this appeal. So uh, when the derivative suit was filed, we moved to dismiss the complaint. It was partially granted and uh, partially denied. And so there are essentially three claims at issue for this appeal. The first being a uh, respondent's trespass claim. The respondent argues, uh, in essence, that the co-op had hired an independent contractor to replace the roof above its unit, um, and in doing, so, and to remediate. Council, uh, council, you you want to dismiss um, on the pleadings. 
Um, so why don't you tell us why you think that these pleadings are not sufficiently detailed given the posture of this case? Um, yeah. Sure. So in terms of the trespass claim, the allegations in the complaint is that the co-op board members uh, caused the trespass, that being the asbestos from the roof into the building um, by virtue of simply hiring an independent contractor and then the independent contractor not doing what he was supposed to do and allowing asbestos into the building. However, the, the, the law is clear on the issue in terms of when an independent contractor is the one responsible for the trespass, that a plaintiff must uh, allege and ultimately illustrate one of two things, that the property owner directed the independent contractor to commit the trespass or that the trespass was necessary to complete the contract, neither of which was alleged in this instance. Instead, plaintiff argues that essentially the uh, co-op board members failed to properly supervise the independent contractor, and then the independent contractor then failed to, to contain the asbestos, and then it um, allegedly uh, entered into the building. Um, and in response to the appeal and to the motion, uh, respondents argue, they cite to a number of cases uh, stating that the uh, allegations are sufficient simply because uh, the law requires that the defendant cause the trespass. But that those cases that respondent relies upon are in instances where an independent contractor is not the one involved in the trespass, it's the defendant themselves. So I would submit that those cases are not applicable or instructive here, and rather it's those cases regarding property owners and independent contractors. This, I would, I would just uh, mention that the, the lower court did not actually address this uh, legal premise at all. Instead, the motion court was focused on whether intent is a, is an element of uh, trespass or not. We don't argue whether or not intent is uh, an element, whether that's an, uh, an argument here. That's not what our arguments were based upon. Uh, I will also mention that the motion court was focused on the fact that the uh, board members allegedly refused to conduct further asbestos rem remediation in plaintiff's unit. And that was taken from the fact that plaintiff has these two dozen or so uh, individual claims against the response, uh, excuse me, against the appellants um, about asbestos in their own unit, as opposed to the derivative suit. In the derivative suit, it is, a, it is about any asbestos within the building itself. So, um, is there no is there no question here about whether or not the contractors were directed? Is there not no are there no factual issues here as to whether or not they would have been directed at the work? to do work in certain way? Sorry, Your Honor. The respondent does not allege in, in the uh, papers, in the uh, complaint, amended complaint, never uh, never uh, alleges that the, res that the appellants directed the independent contractor to fail to contain the asbestos and essentially put the asbestos into the building or into plaintiff's unit, um, nor does the plaintiff uh, excuse me, the respondent argue, allege in the papers, in the complaint that, uh, of course, that uh, the uh, asbestos being uh, contaminated in the building was necessary as part of the contract. None of those. Oh, out thank well, you. you have oh. Let me just ask you one quick question. Who sure. directed the asbestos people? When you say who directed the asbestos? Who directed people? where they went? Who hired them? Who got them into the building? We all agree that it, intent is not the issue, but the question is who directed them? And there's no doubt that your clients directed them. They directed where to go, what to do, what work had to be done. You can't, that's not, uh, you're not denying any of that, are you? No, I'm not denying that, they yes. were, that the appellants were those that hired the contractor. And directed their work. They didn't just come in and decide themselves what to do. Someone directed them and that was your client. They directed them to conduct asbestos remediation. They did not direct them to commit a trespass. So, for example, okay, I'm I'm going to ask you to respond on rebuttal. Let's have Mr. Lane. Uh, Your Honor, there are two other counsel. Counsel, you had three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mark Lane here with the firm Lane Kroll LLP for the plaintiff respondent. There are a number of issues here. The trespass issue seems to be the one that is getting the most attention. Um, well, I just want to say that's up to you. Council had three minutes. I think I gave her six. 
Um, <laughs> you use your three minutes the way you think you should. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> the court below, Your Honor, was correct, Your Honors, in um, sustaining three categories of claims here, two of them for trespass involving asbestos contamination in the building and my client's unit, um, and two for um, discriminatory practice in subletting, <clears throat> and two for the improper transfer of common space to a shareholder. Um, much of this relates to entrenchment of the board. There is a long history, which is fairly well detailed, I think, in the complaint in the case, a long history of malice among these parties. Um, and um, the plaintiff, the, nom the nominal plaintiff, uh, has been treated very badly, we allege, by the board. And a lot of the motivations here involve that. The roof work, was of course, this compelled. is not merely about being treated badly. It's about having the sufficiency of um, your your claims here. So why don't you tell us why those remaining claims, the 7th, 8th, 11th through 14th, um, are sufficient? Because in each such case, they allege the elements of the cause of action, quite simply, as the court detailed in its decision below. Trespass... Um, in, the case, in this case, the board was, as a matter of law, the defendants' appellants were, as a matter of law, responsible for the work done on the roof under both federal, state, and local law, which involved asbestos remediation with extensive regulatory requirements. The, um, the board used a contractor that had been established previously to have done unlawful work over um, the shareholder's objection. Um, that work was done in such a shoddy manner as to, to leave massive, massive amounts of asbestos in the apartment and the building, more than 80 times the federally established safety limit. The let, me just, let me just direct you to a couple of other points. There's also the question of the fees and the, um, I think uh, the, the um, I'm sorry, the um, the fees that were that were between the commercial spaces and the um, condo spaces, and then also the the move of the electrical equipment from one of the commercial spaces to the common space to to take up and I guess taking away common space from the whole building. Do you want to speak to those briefly? Of course, Your Honor. <clears throat> the electrical equipment was previously located along the sidewall of one shareholders unit, who's now a board member, um, he didn't want it there. So he convinced the board to move it to a space adjacent to common space that was already common space. The board then undertook to do that and charged it to the co-op at the, to the tune of $175,000, in effect, giving this commercial shareholder space that he didn't previously have that had belonged to the co-op <clears throat> and then getting in exchange, quote unquote, for that, a, a, a space at the other end of the building that was already adjacent to um, common space. It's kind of hard to And describe. the other fiduciary breach you're alleging with regard to the fees? The subletting fees. Subletting. <clears throat> there is right. a... The, the commercial shareholders who control the building and control the board um, have not been charged subletting fees consistently and at the same percentages and rates as residential shareholders and have not been subject to essentially any of the rules, approval, re-evaluation every two years, et cetera, that residential shareholders have been subject to. Our allegation, which was sustained below, is that this is part of a entrenchment plan that keeps the commercial shareholders happy as a result of which they continually re-elect the same board members and support those board members decisions so this is this hurts the corporation um in one case one of the sh commercial shareholders gets more than five hundred thousand dollars a year in profits from subletting part of her space and pays thank only you. a tiny percentage of that to the co-op thank you any questions from the panel thank you um miss aiello you have one minute Thank you, Your Honor. Just to briefly respond to Judge Scarpula's uh, question regarding uh, direction of the trespass, 
Uh, it's true that the board members directed the independent contractor to uh, conduct asbestos remediation, but it did not, con uh, and plaintiff does not allege this, that they directed that the independent contractor commit the trespass. That is what the case law says. One of the cases cited by the respondent Biggio, uh, 675 F3D 163, states if they directed the trespass or such trespass was necessary to complete the contract with the independent contractor, then the property uh, owner can be held liable. But that is not what is alleged, and that is not is what that is not it, that is not what happened. So it is not simply that they directed the independent contractor to do work, and then the result was uh, trespass. Rather, it, it it is required that a plaintiff allege that the trespass was directed, which is not the allegation here. To briefly, Ms. Mayall, this is Justice Kennedy, and and let me say that the amended complaint in fact, does allege that the board was required to uh, conduct certain uh, work on the roof, and certainly that it was the board that caused the infiltration of the uh, asbestos into the building by affirmative uh, action. So why why couldn't the trial or court uh, accord favorable inferences to the plaintiffs here? Because the plaintiff has acknowledged that their, their argument is centered, as, as Your Honor said, that they caused the trespass. But that is not what the, the relevant case law is when it is an independent contractor who is committing the trespass. Plaintiff does not allege, nor could they, that the board members were the ones who went up on the roof and then took asbestos from the roof and put it into the building. It, they would be required to, de to allege and ultimately demonstrate that they caused it by, by virtue of directing the independent contractor to so, commit the trespass. Counsel, then how, this is Judge Kapoor, then how do you distinguish Dwayne Reed, the, our, our decision in Dwayne Reed? This seems to me like pretty much the same situation. So in Dwayne Reed, I don't believe, I reviewed Dwayne Reed, I don't believe that this, uh, that the case law was addressed by the uh, property owner in that instance uh, regarding how, an in, how a property owner can be held liable for an independent contractor's trespass. But I would direct the court's attention to the holding in Brown, uh, which is a similar instance in that a property owner hired a contractor to cut down wood on its own property. So in that instance, they directed the work. However, but the work was simply to go on my property, cut down the cut down the wood. The independent contractor then went beyond the contract and cut down wood from the neighboring unit. That was a trespass, but not directed by the owner because that's not what the contract was for. Similarly, Thank here- Thank you. I'm going to ask that you wrap up. Okay. Um, very briefly on the two issues that uh, that no, I no no as in finish your thought on that issue <laughs> and more than one <laughs> if so you have nothing further then no I was just saying similarly to the holding in Brown uh, when you're directing just the work the contract which does not require trespass that's insufficient to demonstrate a direction of trespass okay thank you both thank, thank you, you your honors thank you your honors yes Santa Pau versus Brownstone two condo. Mr. McGovern. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. Happy St. Patrick's Day and a, a preemptive uh, good feast of St. Joseph, if, if anyone. Thank you. That one. And the same to you. Thank you. Um, as you know, this is a trip and fall accident. The uh, plaintiff was exiting an elevator, claims her foot slipped and forward and made contact with a misleveled uh, floor. Um, she didn't see it at the time. And her testimony was quite clear on that fact. We moved for summary judgment the building defendants uh, on two facts. One, that her case was speculative because she couldn't identify what caused the accident. And two, even if there was a misleveling, that the building defendants were not on notice of this. How did you show that there was no misleveling? Um, did you? There was uh, testimony by the buildings uh, porter slash uh, concierge that he saw the accident on the closed circuit TV monitor, went over afterwards, he rubbed his hand on the sill and on the elevator itself, and there was no misleveling and no wetness. Um, How long went, afterwards was that? Are we talking about the next day? No, it was immediately afterwards. Um, was, the, was the plaintiff still present? 
plaintiff was still have been present. This was uh, this happened in the building lobby. He's so what you're saying is that he was in a different room and he went right down when he saw her fall. Is that what you're saying? And then she was still there uh, and he touched the surfaces at that time. Essentially, yes, but it's even closer than in another room. He was in the lobby at the concierge desk, so he gets up, he comes right over. Um, now, plaintiff oh, never so saw this is a, a, There was a video, correct? There was a video taken of the fall, correct? That is absolutely correct. The video is inside, is taken from inside the elevator. It's this building's closed circuit television system. And um, the video shows everybody getting out of the elevator just fine. And she just crumples. What does uh, the video show about the leveling or misleveling? Well, the plaintiff's husband, Thomas Santapo, is shown getting out of the elevator. His uh, foot actually spans the gap between the lobby floor and the elevator, and there's no misleveling uh, that you can see in that footage. Now, Mr. Santapu came forward uh, with his uh, affidavit after we moved for summary judgment and said, well, before I got out, I looked down and I saw that there was an inch and a quarter uh, misleveling condition. He walks out fine, and his wife then walks out and she falls. But if you look at that video, Mr. Santapau, God bless him, he rides the elevator wrong. He's one of these guys, he gets in, he puts his back to the elevator door, and he looks inwards towards the passengers. Um, he's from Ohio. Um, he That's never... This is Judge Scarpula. When did the misleveling claim come up? Because I thought originally the claim was there was some liquid on the floor. When was the first time that misleveling became an issue? At her first deposition, she said her foot slipped and then it came in contact with something. She didn't know what it was. She thought it was a misleveled floor. Um, did she ever say that her boot got caught and she fell forward? Um, there was some the indication. The toe of her boot? Did she ever say that the toe of her boot got caught and she fell forward? Yes, she did. Um, and when was that? Was I, that I, earlier or later? It was either at her first deposition or her second deposition. I can't recall. I apologize. Yeah. Um, well, let me just ask you again. In the complaint, the, the allegation was liquid on the floor, right? That is correct. And, and in no particulars, it was liquid on the floor. And... Our guy said that he felt that he could find no wetness. And so we moved uh, on the grounds that there's no prior notice and also that the plaintiff's case was speculative. Uh, the court below said, no, uh, you didn't prove your prima facie case because you didn't uh, show uh, that you took all the steps necessary to inspect it. Um, I think that we we pretty, sh thank pretty you. well did. OK, thank you. Um, I, Ms. Solari, please. May it please the court. There's absolutely no evidence in this case that the elevator ever misleveled. The first time plaintiff ever goes to that building was the day of her accident. She testifies that herself, her husband, her cousin, her uncle, they all get in at the lobby level. No one has any difficulty. No one trips or falls. They all head upstairs. Now you've got Jason Henry, who's the building's porter of nine years. He's sitting stationed within the lobby. He actually has a clear view of the monitor that shows that surveillance camera from inside the cab. He recalls the group heading upstairs without any issues or complaints. Now they spend about an hour up in the apartment. Plaintiff has a couple glasses of eggnog. They then go back to that elevator on the higher floor. Uh, no one trips or falls. There are no issues. Everything is perfectly fine. And in fact, the elevator is leveled. They also had no issues getting out on that higher floor either. Um, okay, let's talk about where she fell. Can you see with the naked eye whether or not the, the elevator is level or mislevel from the video? That's at the when those doors open on the video, this is at the 22nd mark. You can see that the floor is perfectly level between the two surfaces and the two L, the cab sill and the landing floor sill. Um, at the moment she falls, at, to some extent, the point where her feet are is obscured by someone's legs. But again, right before that, you see her husband place his foot directly on the horizontal space between the two sills. No problem, unhindered, doesn't have to raise his foot. Plaintiff then falls as she steps out, and then the remaining four passengers are shown in the video, all stepping out after the fact, some of them literally shuffling across that horizontal sill surface without any difficulty. And then when the final person within the elevator steps out, 
you have a clear view, you see it is completely level. Um, and just to go back to what we were discussing with Mr. Henry, he testifies that he actually witnesses the accident happen on the monitor since he is monitoring the elevator. He's around the corner, but also at the lobby level. He immediately goes over, finds plaintiff on the floor, helps her up. He testifies that he sees that the elevator is leveled at this point. He then helps plaintiff to a bench. He goes right back and he uses his hands and his feet to confirm that, in fact, everything is perfectly level. Now, so his testimony was from the beginning and continued that he went right over once he saw that and the plaintiff was still there. And that's where he touched the elevator, the floor, the um, the space between it to see if it was wet or misleveled. Is that right? Correct. To be very specific, I think he helped her. He saw it with his eyes while she's still there, while she's still present. He helps her up into a bench, which is right there. He then goes back over and confirms with his hands and his feet. And most importantly, he does not take that elevator cab out of service because there is nothing wrong with the elevator. He does not call the superintendent of the building. And most importantly, he doesn't call my client Rotavelli to report the incident uh, or to have them come and look at it because the elevator is perfectly fine. Now, he Thank also. You. Thank you. you. You had three minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Friedman? Good afternoon, Your Honors. Good afternoon. Um, so I think there are two sets of issues here. Obviously, one is causation and one is notice. Um, I, I just do want to clear something up, though, before we get into that. We had a complaint. We had an amended complaint. And both of them did, in fact, allege that there was a defect in an elevator and that it was not level. You could see it. It's at page 42 of the record. It's paragraph 36 of our original complaint. And then again at page 77 of the record. So there certainly was a claim involving a misleveling. It wasn't just that the floor was wet. And the second item, to the extent it's relevant, is that I believe Mr. Henry did first check the elevator after plaintiff had left. She was actually assisted by, I believe it was her uncle and her husband up, and then they carried her out of the building. It was at that point that the porter supposedly ran his hand over the threshold and said that it was level. So, counsel, with that, this is Justice way, Kennedy. But didn't the plaintiff, you know, testify at her deposition that she never saw any misleveling? She did not even uh, know what her foot got caught on. What she testified to—it's at pages one forty-three and one forty-four of the record—was that as she's exiting the elevator, her her foot slips, her toe catches something by the threshold, which she believed was a height differential between the cab and the floor. She then looked at a photo, it's on, well, the photos you have at page 636, but she testified to it at page 151 of the record. I thought she said she, I'm sorry, but I thought she said it was a one inch gap. She was estimating a gap and there is a gap. There, uh, right. The, if you just let me finish, please. There is a gap between the elevator and the edge of the floor because of course, Otherwise, the elevator wouldn't be able to go up and down if it was right against the wall. So there is always a gap. And that's what she speaks about, a one-inch gap. She doesn't say a, a one-inch mislevel. Well, when she was referring to the photograph, and this is on page 151, she does say that this depicted misleveling that I was talking about. Obviously, there's also a horizontal gap. I understand that. She never testified my foot went down, it dipped. She said, my foot slid, it caught something, the gap, and I fell forward. And then, of course, you have the affidavit of her husband. And I understand if defendants want to take issue with that. It's something they could cross-examine him on at trial, where he said, I noticed a height what difference. About, what about the video itself? I mean, we've all looked at the video. The video was, so what about that video itself? Isn't it, can't one see from the video itself whether there's misleveling or not, the complete absence of misleveling? I don't think that's clear from the video. I have watched it. I've watched it in normal speed and slow motion, especially the height differential here. I don't see how you can look at that video and conclude, especially as a matter of law. Counsel, you're this saying, let me just level. interrupt you for a second. You're saying that you couldn't see on that really clear video if there was an inch and a half which is what I think the husband testified, difference in height. You wouldn't be able to see that. That video is pretty clear. We're not talking about 
this. We're talking about this. And you're saying you can't see that on the video? I, I do not. And maybe the husband, okay. whether it's exactly an inch and a half or That's not, I don't know. That's what he testified to, right? So I, I take him at his word. Right. And we also have the testimony of REI's witness who said that if there was even more than a quarter of an inch of misleveling, I believe that's a page 528 of the record, they would have to come in and no, fix that's it. That's an expert. No, we're talking about the people who actually looked. Your client's husband said, I saw an inch and a half, right? He did. Which and is a very, client. very big difference from a quarter of an inch. And Mr. Freeman, I just want to go back to the uh, plaintiff's uh, deposition because you know, pages 154, 270 through 271 and 180, she indicated it was her belief that the elevator was misleveled because she felt her toe catch on something which she could not identify. And then also she indicated on those same pages, she didn't know what caused her to slip and fall, never felt any wetness, and she never felt any mislevel condition. Can you address to, that? Sure. To this point, I'm actually going to refer you to a case that I had and lost. It was from this court back in December of 2020. It's called Mandel, M-A-N-D-E-L versus 340 Owners Corporation. You had a plaintiff there who also rode an elevator down to the lobby of a building. The door opens. She starts to step out. Like the plaintiff here, she says her foot starts to slide. She did not know exactly why. Was she there a then, video in this case? In Mandela, there was there was not a video. Well, we're talking about something very different, a video in this case. And I think that's the significant difference between the man, the case that you ju have just spoken about. Um, if you can wrap up very quickly because your time has ended. Sure. I was only referencing that case to answer Justice Kennedy's question, where it was a similar okay. chain of events where the plaintiff did not look at the match she supposedly tripped on at any point. However, she testified, as I stepped out, I felt the front of my foot catch on something. And this court held that even that circumstantial evidence was enough to raise an issue as to proximate cause. Thank because, you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. McGovern, you have one minute. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Learned counsel for the plaintiff indicated that the defendants could cross-examine Mr. Santafu at time of trial about his affidavit, but I think that the court below uh, should have rejected the affidavit outright, um, and I think this court set the standard for when such affidavits should be rejected in uh, the Villamar versus 490 East 181st Street case, uh, 50 AD 3rd 469, where um, plaintiff claimed to have slipped on a banana peel. He said he defendants said that uh, they had checked the place where the accident occurred. They didn't see any garbage. Plaintiff came back with an affidavit from his live in companion that said, oh, yeah, I saw the banana peels on the stair. Um, now, other than the Keystone Cops comedy uh, esque uh, matter of um, that kind of uh, an affair. Uh, the court said, no, this is obviously tailored to avoid uh, earlier uh, testimony. Um, so I don't think it should go to trial. Uh, I don't think there should be cross-examination. It should have been rejected. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. S Thank you Ms. Solari. I think my uh, co-defendant did an excellent job of addressing that point regarding the affidavit. And so if there are no further questions, I will rely on my brief. Thank you very much. And thank you all. Thank, thank all, you, Your Honor. Thank you. All three of you. Thank you very much for your, for your argument. People versus James Challen. Oh, Shaylin, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Your Honor. It's Lauren Jones from the Legal Aid Society here on behalf of Mr. Challen in this matter. Um, so in this case, there is a guilty plea with a forfeiture. And the forfeiture was clearly unauthorized by law and should be vacated by this court. Counsel, didn't your client agree to the forfeiture? And, um, and, and the law at the time permitted this. The, so it, was, it was, I was just saying, so it was permissible at the time and your client signed um, an agreement to the forfeiture, a consent. So two, two responses first about the form and then also then next about the state of the law. So the 
forfeiture form, um, you know, as a boilerplate legalese five page form um, that the allegation or the um, whether or not this is the proceeds of the crime is one small line in there. And this court has the power, the judicial oversight to look at whether or not that forfeiture complied with CPLR article 13A, even if it is, was part of a an agreement and a plea proceeding. Of course, right. And this was, by the way, unpreserved as well. Yes, but again, um, because this uh, our argument is that this forfeiture was completely unauthorized. It should not be subject to preservation requirements because um, the argument is essentially that the court was simply without the power to order this forfeiture. So the preservation um, preservation requirement should not be any bar to judicial review of this claim. Um, and as to the state of the law, um, the uh, at, this case is on direct appeal. The, um, it is before this court uh, on appeal from the judgment of conviction, and the court should consider the law as it stands today. The legislature clearly intended uh, to amend the forfeiture law to make it more um, restrictive, and it's clearly a remedial amendment that was made to remove the common plan and scheme liability here. So this court should apply that law um, as it currently stands as the legislature intended. Um, and as the law currently stands, forfeiture is only proper if a this, the property or money is related to the crime of conviction or a crime that was charged in the indictment. And which, here, which the defendant consented to in the signing and in the language of the forfeiture. Um, I mean, the, despite, it was all part, whether it was a stipulation or the agreement, that was part of it. Yes, but again, this court has the ability to review it and to see whether or not it actually complied with the CPLR as it was required to. And, you know, as the court, um, the fourth department in People versus McCoy looked at a forfeiture that was part of a guilty plea that had a forfeiture agreement and determined that it did not actually comply with the CPLR because there was no nexus between the crime and the money that was forfeited, which is essentially the same situation here. Um, so in addition, um, just to uh, address the prosecution's argument regarding the common uh, scheme or plan, uh, which was the law, but before it was amended, that um, the forfeiture is similarly improper under that um, theory. So, it, you know, it's possible, even assuming that the facts here um, suggest that there was some uh, sale, marijuana sale, um, you know, kind of at large, there also has to be proof that the money that he had was actually the profit of that sale, was the proceeds of that sale, of um, some sale. And here, I mean, it's just money in a car. There's no evidence of where the money was in the car. There's no like claim that it was like in a bag with the marijuana. In fact, in the omnibus, there's a suggestion that it's not, it wasn't even Mr. Child's car. And so, um, you know, plenty of New Yorkers, there's research that low-income New Yorkers often don't have bank accounts and keep their money with them for safekeeping. Ms. Jones, this is Justice Kennedy, and I'm not sure that uh, McCoy even applies here because in McCoy, the funds were not the proceeds of the crime. Uh, the funds did not belong to the defendant. But here we have a stipulation where the defendant said that the money constituted the proceeds of a crime and was subject to forfeiture. So I don't think McCoy is applicable here. Well, in McCoy, there was a stipulation as well. The uh, Fourth Department is clear that uh, Mr. McCoy signed a forfeiture stipulation there as well. So, you know, the the, um, and, you know, this is a, this, the forfeiture stipulation is a, you know, five page boilerplate document. It is not tailored in any way. It doesn't even say like something like this money was the proceeds of the uh, marijuana sale. It just says the subject property constitutes the proceeds of si crime, the substituted proceeds of crime and or the instrumentalities of crime. I mean, it's really not specific. And Mr. Chalen signs once at the end of this 
five page form document. And so the, this court should review to see whether or not the execution of that document was proper in the first place. What counsel, this is Sorry. Judge Kapula. He was represented by counsel, right? Yes, he was. So he's not, it's not, it's not, counsel's there and is available and it can, can explain and I'm sure did thoroughly explain to him what it means to sign that stipulation, right? You're not saying that counsel didn't do that. No. And he there. signed it, right? He, right? he was explained by counsel and he signed it. We see that every day. So why should we disturb that? Because if something is legally unauthorized, if it was just improper, the court had no power to do it, it doesn't really matter if counsel was there or not. The court shouldn't have ordered the forfeiture. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tisney. May it please the court, Philip Tisney for the respondent. Um, as your honors noted, there are two waivers in this case. There's the appeal so waiver. So let's talk about the forfeiture. Does your office still use these forfeitures? Does it still use the forms? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I would imagine they do. I don't know if they've updated the form in any hasn't way. Hasn't the law changed? My point is, hasn't the law changed with regard to this? Oh, to reflect the 2019 amendments? Um, you know, Your Honor, I'm sorry. I, I don't know if they have amend, uh, changed the form. I, I probably should have known that. But um, I would suspect that they do and that they have uh, updated. I, I think what's clear here, though, is that the 2019 amendments don't apply here. The, the legislature couldn't have been more clear that those amendments were going to apply to crimes that were committed after October 2019. This crime was committed in April 2016. Um, the, the I understand, uh, but if it was committed today, it is, is not something that would fall under this forfeiture. Is that right? Well, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know how you would handle a, a, a forfeiture in a possession case um, under the 2019 law. Again, what I know is that the 2019 law doesn't apply here. Um, going to counsel's point about how this was an un unlawful forfeiture, forfeiture um, I'll just point out that, uh, you know, he agreed to the forfeiture for a reason, which likely was that this was obviously money that was connected with the criminal activity. Now, I can point to evidence up and down that um, defendant was engaged in the sale of marijuana, no less than his admission to the probation department that he was engaged in the sale of marijuana. But I think the most compelling evidence is the fact that he only, by his own admission, only made $200 a week. Um, so, you know, if he only makes $200 a week, how is he going to have $3,000 in cash on him late on a Friday night as he's driving around with over a pound of marijuana separately wrapped in 50 little baggies? Uh, well, why don't, we, why don't we discuss, I don't think there's any question that he had whatever it was, 11 one pound bags of marijuana or whatever it might have been. Um, the question is really more to the forfeiture and the form and the specificity or the lack thereof of um, factors that um, would have been required. Well, I, I, certainly there isn't any case out of this court or any other court that they've cited or that I've found that would require the form to be more specific. Um, uh, you, there isn't any case that they've pointed to or that we've found that would require any kind of colloquy on the record. Certainly the model colloquy doesn't doesn't require anything about forfeiture. This is a civil settlement. It should be treated like any other civil settlement. He he recited in the in the stipulation that he had read the stipulation, that his lawyer had read the stipulation, that they had talked about it, that they fully understand what it was doing, that he had entered into it voluntarily. And of course, he admitted that the $3,000 that he was uh, handing over were in fact the proceeds of crime. And like I said, the evidence um, that would have been introduced in an Article 13a proceeding had he not decided to forego that proceeding pretty clearly showed that. And that's why probably he decided he didn't want to go to the expense of a 13A proceeding. Well, let's not talk about probabilities. We don't know. Thank you. Counsel? Thank you. So um, discussing the, you know, the amount of money that he had, I think that, um, you know, he did have a part-time job, as um, uh, my adversary just pointed out. He and you know, someone who doesn't have a bank account is likely to keep their money with them for safekeeping. And there's really no, um, there's just no, without any other facts, without any other link between this money and um, uh, some other drug sale, there's just, 
there, it's just speculation to guess where exactly it came from. And um, just to briefly um, address, address the retroactivity again, I mean, the legislature wanted to restrict forfeiture in this way. It's a remedial statute. And I would note on the effective date that the part of this bill that made this amendment uh, uh, changed a lot of different statutes, including a bunch of penal law statutes. And the language about um, the uh, crime committed on or about October 2019 is the kind of language that the legislature typically uses to amend penal law statutes. So it's reasonable to assume that that part is meant to amend the penal law and not the civil, uh, 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 meant to apply to the penal law and not to the civil statute at question here. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. FGLS Equity versus Sagist LLC. May it please the court, Russell Bogart on behalf of the appellant Sagist LLC and Larry Warshaw as the sole trustee of Caroline Enterprises Inc. pension plan. Appellants were two members of FGLS Equity LLC, which was a feeder fund into the Madoff Ponzi scheme. Stephen Mendelow, who received millions of dollars in kickbacks from Madoff, operated FGLS along with his wife, Nancy. After Stephen and Nancy's death- Council, let me, let me just ask you, how do we deal with the business judgment rule here? Yes, the business judgment rule um, rested upon a decision by the lower court that uh, first, that Mr. Turchin um, comported himself with a standard of care because his reliance on counsel. However, FGLS forfeited the reliance on counsel defense because they cherry picked certain advice from their counsel to be inserted into the record and objected to the disclosure of the full advice provided by counsel. The law is clear that when a party defends a business decision by asserting the advice of counsel, the party affirmatively waives the attorney client privilege by placing the reliance on counsel directly at issue. The law is also clear that a party cannot rely upon the advice of counsel while cherry picking which advice shall be disclosed in the litigation. In fact, all of the decisions decided by the decree and by FGLS in its brief for the position on the reliance of counsel actually involve circumstances where the advice was disclosed. For instance, in the case involving JP Morgan, in which the, the court held that the directors reasonably decided not to pursue litigation. There, two independent law firms published reports to the shareholders of 100 pages or more, which were based upon investigations that, that entailed reviewing millions and millions of documents, literally millions of documents, and interviewing scores of witnesses. Here, we're simply told that there were some conversations between counsel and Mr. Turchin, in which it was discussed that there were potential defenses, the results were uncertain, and litigation may entail uh, expense and delay. The circumstances couldn't even could, couldn't be more sharply in, in contrast. I also suggest that the uh, argument or the concern about delay and cost of litigation is illusory and a false dichotomy. Mr. Turchin knew that Mr. Mendelo had committed very severe acts of wrongdoing. In fact, he admits it in a claim that he actually once filed against Nancy Mendelo's estate. He also knew that, that Mr. Mendelo's actions wound up in Sage's capital account being completely depleted. It was highly foreseeable that the appellants would fight tooth and nail. And that's why three years after Mr. Turchin's uh, appointment, we're still here litigating. So this How wasn't about- How many people are actually challenging this? out of um, the full amount of eight or something. How many are here challenging this? Uh, the appellants are, are the only two that are, are litigating. Two out of how many? Two out of 15. 15. Or 15. It, it, it's kind of confusing because some entities are controlled by the same family. So the Mendel, like four or five entities related to the Mendelos and- What's not confusing is that the remaining 13 have, are, are not part of this challenge, correct? Several submitted affidavits in the lower court submitted, supporting uh, say just position. Um, an, an, it was reported to the court that another member did not understand the issues and called us up the day before the hearing and saying, once I've read the papers, I'm outraged. And they were relying upon Mr. Turchin's descriptions of the issues. And when they saw the other side 
they became outraged. So three are challenging this. No, no, I'm sorry. But yeah. let me just ask you, counsel, none of those, I mean, of all those people who were so outraged, none of them appealed. It's just you and another party, right? Two parties that I represent have appealed. So all the rest of them didn't appeal. They accepted the, the distribution after the judge ruled that the receiver had distributed it appropriately, correct? Well, it was too late for them to appeal because they didn't uh, they didn't object to the original petition. I'm talking even of the ones that objected below, none of them except you and another your clients appealed, right? Correct. We were the only two that appealed, but the others, it was clear, were misinformed. And, and now, Mr. now Mr. Perch Church, and secondly, because we're dealing with the rights of minority members, I'm not really sure what you know whether that uh, per, you know governs or not. But other members certainly uh, expressed their confusion um, and expressed that they didn't understand these issues, and they put it in affidavits to the court. There are okay, two supporting thank affidavits. Thank you. You have two minutes rebuttal. Let me hear what um, Mr. Yescu have to, has to say about the business judgment rule. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. I, I'd like to just briefly address the discovery issue. Uh, Justice Cohen decided that there were only two factors that he needed to decide that the business judgment rule applied. And that was number one, that any the, any litigation would be time consuming, delay distribution, and number two, it would be very expensive and risk depleting uh, the limited assets that FGLS has and, and the, the desire to distribute those assets as soon as possible. Um, the appellants have really failed to, they never challenged the, those decisions before Justice Cohen, and Justice Cohen had no problem uh, reaching those conclusions based on his own knowledge and uh, experience as, a, as a, a, I guess, at Davis Polk and as a, as a commercial uh, judge. So the issue is, why did we need discovery? Um, uh, <clears throat> The appellants are somehow submitting that, well, you know, if I didn't write a 40-page memo and, and burn through $100,000, or if I didn't do this or I didn't do that, which uh, apparently uh, Chase can afford a multi-billion, billion, billion-dollar billion company, that, that that rule applies to even small companies. And they never showed why uh, any discovery would be material or necessary to justify uh, Mr. Turchin's uh, business judgment. Counsel, this and, is Judge Scarpula. How much was left in the receivership to distribute? Okay, we re, uh, received about 2.9 million from Picard uh, and uh, estimate, uh, before this all started, we estimated expenses of $200,000. So we're, uh, there've been some more expenses. So we're, we're talking about two and a half million dollars uh, approximately at this point in time. That is now 11 years old, right? The, I think it was 2010. No, it's, 2008 is when Madoff. 2008, I'm so sorry, we're, right. We're so now we're talking years. 13 years in, and and do we want to get our money now or wait for right. another? Right, and, and I want to address the you know the percentages here. Only 19 percent of the positive capital objected. Those are the people, people um, represented by uh, uh, by Mr. Bogart. Uh, the, nobody else objected. Now, you know, we've been fairly candid. All the people whose 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 money was transferred from CMP objected, but but Justice Cohen upheld our our decision that they wouldn't have any positive capital, so they don't count. And also, a number of people did object to paying any money to the Mendelo Foundation, and and that we really kicked that decision down the road and, and hope that the Mendelo Foundation would litigate that and you're about to hear hear that. But if you just look at, at the people who wanted to sue, uh, you know, again, it's, it's only 19% who actually showed up. The rest of the people would like their money. They've been waiting 12 or 13 years. I get calls, you know, when am I getting the money, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, you know, I would ask that you uh, affirm the uh, Are there any facts decision. alleged that the reliance on advice of counsel was done in bad faith? Pardon? Were there any facts alleged to show that the reliance on counsel was done in bad faith? No, there were no facts uh, at all um, alleged. Thank you. Uh, 
Council for Intervener, is it Mr. Schaefer? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Fine. Uh, may it please the court, good afternoon, uh, Your Honors. Uh, I have uh, basically two points that I'd like to make. One is that the issue of a distribution to the Mendelo Foundation, a 501c3 charitable foundation, which has already distributed in excess of $1.5 million, is one uh, that really is not before the court. And it's not before the court because if you examine uh, the grounds for the appeal set forth by uh, Mr. Bogart uh, in this appeal, uh, he challenged uh, Justice Cohn's degree, decree to the extent that it barred FGLS members from bringing claims against FGLS and its members, managing members, and agents, and against the Mendelo parties, uh, excluding the foundation. The appellants are not appealing from the decree insofar as it directed the pro rata distribution of funds received from the Madoff trustee, Mr. Picard, in accordance with Mr. Turchin's plan, which included a distribution to the foundation. Accordingly, your honors need not address appellants' contention that the foundation should be denied its pro rata distribution of these funds. Nonetheless, because the appellants dedicate, dedicated short sections of their briefs to rehashing their arguments below that the foundation should be denied its distribution, I would make the following point. For the reasons set forth by Mr. Yescu uh, in his briefs, Justice Cohn's decree correctly ruled that the appellants had not met their evidentiary burden to show that Mr. Turchin was operating in bad faith. As such, he was entitled to the protection of the business judgment rule with respect to his decision not to sue the Mendelo parties, as well as his decision to include the Mendelo Foundation, which had a positive capital account, meaning it put more money into FGLS than it withdrew in his planned distribution. I might also just note that the appellate's contention that the foundation was funded with, quote, ill-gotten gains stolen from FGLS's members, end quote, or with the illicit proceeds from CNP is a fiction with absolutely no support in the record. Thank, Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're back to you, Mr. Bogart. You have two minutes. Two minutes to each or two minutes total? Two minutes totals. Okay, so I'll be quick. Uh, first, with respect to discovery, the issue is how time-consuming would the discovery have been? It would have taken Mr. Yesco five minutes to zip up an email over to us all of the attorney advice that he provided to us. So the question is, is whether discovery would be time-consuming. It would have taken five minutes. Five minutes. It's also highly material information because the, the, the decree principally relied upon the alleged advice provided to find the applicability of the business judgment rule. Third, while we don't have any basis to believe that the advice was provided in bad faith, we do believe that Mr. Turchin well, was not Isn't that important interested. to substantiating the, the business judgment rule, to the reliance on the business judgment rule? I mean, why I would we find, why should we find that they violated the business judgment rule? They're not protected, I should say, by the business judgment rule if you can't allege any bad faith. Because they have the, they have the compliant, they have to comply with the duty of care and the duty of loyalty. And the sole basis for complying with the duty of loyalty, because Turchin is not a lawyer, is that he purportedly relied upon his lawyer. But the, the, the legal advice was forfeited because they refused to allow discovery of it. And the case law is in, uncontroverted in the record. Secondly, we separately argue that Mr. Turchin is not disinterested. Mr. Turchin, one, has potential liability. Two, he worked for a number of years with Mr. Mendelo, and he admits that he knew that Mr. Mendelo was committing fraudulent acts. Maybe not the Ponzi scheme, but he knew about the fraudulent tax returns and financial statements, and he continued to work for him. And it raises which questions. Is not, which, which really doesn't affect this action because it's separate. I mean, but the, it, 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 it relates to his judgment and his relation to whether except he's Except that far you from, just said his judgment is in reliance of, on an attorney. But they can't introduce that. We, 
he, he still has the independent obligation and good faith to take information from the client and make an independent good faith uh, assessment. And if he's conflicted, he can't do that. And the lawyer said, I didn't tell him what to do. I just told him factors. There could be delay. It, it, yes, so those factors. You, you're telling me on the one hand that he didn't use his independent, um, you know, thought process and he didn't arrive at these things independently. And, and on the other hand, you're saying, oh, but the lawyer didn't give him the advice. You're saying the lawyer just laid out factors. The lawyer laid out factors. He used his independent, uh, you know, ability to review these factors. Well, Your Honor, we don't know what he did because we don't have any discovery. I, I'm sorry. I just thought that's process. what you just said. But anyway, I think we get... I think we understand everyone's point. Thank you very much, all three of you, for arguing today. Thank you. G Builders versus Bondex. <clears throat> you may begin. Mr. Rappel, I believe. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you, Your Honor. This is Jason Bittiger for the respondent. Uh, it's Mr. Deal, Joshua Deal, I believe. It's arguing it for the- uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I had jo okay. That's yeah. Correct. But is he here? I you checked in earlier. Oh, I, I think he's having a little difficulty. You know what? I'm going to move on to the next case. And if he, we'll just call it right after this one, okay? Thank you, Judge. I'll be here. Okay. People versus Rosalind Pilmar. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Sam talking for Ms. Pilmar. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Your Honor, the appellant Rosalind Pilmar has advanced three significant violations of her right to, a, to receive a fair trial on appeal. Each one of these violations standing alone independently warrant reversal of the conviction in this case. Moreover, a review of all these grounds collectively and also under an examination where these violate the effect that the combined viol the combined effect of these violations clearly shows you that not only isn't reversal warranted but it's compelled by the facts of these of this case first the people waited 21 years from the incident to bring this prosecution so that 21 years is significant. That's true, of course. We don't usually see that, but um, it's not without basis in case law that the cases take time. It depends on whether they're twiddling their thumbs or doing an investigation. And here there's evidence that um, it was due to, first of all, the client saying that she didn't, she had a great relationship or the relationship was fine. So they looked in other places and there was a question of, um, they, they were trying to strengthen the case after that. So they looked elsewhere. Um, I don't know that there's, I didn't see anything that, to allege that there was bad faith in the record. They went to the FBI during this time, in fact, had to go back again. So this is not a case where it was just sitting dormant for 21 years. And I think there are cases that have been cited with 17 years, 15 years, long periods of time also. Your Honor, it sat dormant for the most part during that time. There were periodic events where they conducted the investigation. For example, uh, there was DNA found sometime about 18 years after, 18 years uh, before the, pr the prosecution was charged. They didn't do anything with that. You mean the DNA of the of her brother? brother. Of her yes. brother. And, and more importantly is. But what, that wouldn't what, have led to, that would not necessarily have connected um, the defendant. But, I mean, didn't they then find the babysitter who did not reveal information originally and then reveal the information thereafter that was significant? Well, that what's significant there is they interviewed that babysitter numerous times at the time, right around when the events happened, within weeks, within days, during the time, during the morning period. She was, she was interviewed many times. We don't know exactly what was said during that because during this time, the police lost the notes and it's in the record that they lost the notes of those interviews. So not only don't we know what was said, we lost the opportunity to cross-examine on that. Additionally, nothing, the, the, the witness did not reveal new information that she didn't know at the time 
at best, taking it at best for the people, they didn't ask them the questions. So what, what the people are asking you to do is reward them for, for not doing a thorough investigation when they should have, and that later, when they decided finally to ask a question that maybe, we don't even know because we don't have the paperwork, maybe wasn't asked in the past, that's their good cause why they didn't why they didn't uh, why they didn't bring the prosecution? No, that's bad cause. That's that they had the opportunity to interview this witness on numerous occasions. As a matter of fact, in our Singer motion, I put forth without explanation again because of this documents without explanation again because of the passage of time, which again is by no fault of the appellant Rosalind Pilmar. There's a note, 2001, spoke to the babysitter, no change in her story. So you're telling me that they interviewed her back when this happened and they didn't ask her about what happened during, at the, around the time of the crime. They interviewed her again in 2001 and they didn't ask her. And then finally, in 2015, the story changes and she and we don't even know that the story changed. We don't have that opportunity to cross examine. Them. That's exactly what Singer talks about when they talk about the extraordinary period of time, such as 21 years. They, they say that, you know what? Prejudice, you don't even have to show prejudice, defendant. You know why? Because it's presumed. But in this case, we don't even have to presume that prejudice because Ms. Pilmar was cut off from being able to get certain important and crucial pieces of evidence in her defense, which she would have had she been charged back in even within two or three years of the incident, for example. As we went through in a probably painstaking detail in our, in our brief, there's a timeline here that a court that if you take what the people say how this happened, it couldn't have happened that way based on phone calls and traveling. However, that timeline, the people have the malleability to change it by about 20 minutes because they didn't conduct the investigation enough to get the, the tapes from the answering machine at the uh, Pilmar residence that would have shown she was home 20 minutes earlier even though there's phone calls. So what they do is they say, well, we didn't get the tapes. So we argued to the jury that those hit the answering machine. They weren't answered. There was, a, I think there was absolutely no proof of that whatsoever. So because they waited, because they didn't do the proper investigation, Ms. Pilmar is deprived of her right to a fair trial. That's exactly what due process of a law tries to, to prevent. And you have to remember, when you look at this, this is not just an everyday case. Look at it from a thousand feet up. This is a circumstantial only case, okay? So in the circumstantial only case, and as the people summed up, each piece of evidence is patchwork. Each piece of evidence is a little piece that goes towards the, uh, the, the, the narrative that they're trying to tell, a narrative that they control because they waited till 21 years to bring the case. But more importantly, the, the evidence that they bring up as new evidence, the babysitter and uh, one other witness, not only did they have that, not only did they have the ability to get that evidence and should have, that evidence is incrementally important. It's not earth shattering. It doesn't change anything. The babysitter said, oh, she was acting weird. Three other, three other witnesses testified to that. The babysitter said that- uh, You could wrap up your argument. You have two minutes of rebuttal. Uh, the babysitter uh, made other allegations that they were clearly could have been refuted had Ms. Pilmar had the opportunity to defend herself at that time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Axelrod? Uh, first of all, I'm going to apologize. My iPad actually cut out in the middle of my adversary's argument, so I'm not 100% sure what he said. Oh, um, I think you'll be able to handle it. Ms. I was going to say, I am going to re, uh, rebut some of the things I did here. First of all, in terms of the babysitter, it's true that she was interviewed three times, but she was not forthcoming about this information. So and I'll, I'll ask you what I'll ask you what I asked um, Mr. Calkin that led him to answer that, which was that um, it was with regard to the 21 year delay. Uh, and I said that I asked whether or not the case was dormant for that period. And he said, well, it was dormant for large periods and that you, the district attorney's office had information much of the information in the beginning and sought either not to investigate it fully or, you know, the, we had the DNA, the, the time passed. And so the, the tapes from the answering machine weren't there. Uh, the babysitter was interviewed several times before. Um, that information never came out. And so why don't you address those issues? First of all, 
as you pointed out, the case wasn't uh, dormant completely. We were going back and reviewing and asking different people with the DNA evidence, was there anything more they could do? Your own case law has suggested that in a, in a situation where the, the uh, investigation is stymied, there's no requirement that you keep going day after day after day. Part of the, the babysitter was an absolutely crucial witness. And while we, we knew she was the babysitter back in 1996, she was not forthcoming about the defendant's behavior. She, she was interviewed three times and she never said anything about all of the uh, oddities that happened around that time. This is an intelligent woman at trial. She said, well, they didn't ask me the right questions. I submit that that's actually, we hear that a lot of times with our witnesses. Like, well, why didn't you say that? Well, you didn't ask me the right question. That's an excuse. There's simply no way that a woman who was this intelligent didn't recognize when she's uh, asked, you know, yeah, what, what did you notice about Howard, which were the questions that she asked, that she would not have noticed that. Now, yeah. Let me just interrupt you for a second and ask you, how do you respond to the, the um, counsel's argument that he can't, the, the defendant can't defend herself because the information that she needed to defend herself, like her mother's testimony or her mother-in-law, is now gone. How do you respond to that? And the tapes, the tapes go to that point. It's her own answering machine tapes that she didn't uh, keep. You know, the, the defendant throws up her hands like, poor me, I, all of a sudden all this evidence went away. She knew right from the start. In fact, she, she was paranoid about the fact that she was gonna be charged with this. She did all these things. You know, she, uh, she used her own, uh, access to the phone to make alibis for herself, she was absolutely in a position to go, you know what, I'm keeping uh, keeping this answering machine. She was in position to keep the stuff from King, which she says would somehow have shown that she was there a lot at night. I don't know how that was supposed to show that, but that was her company, which she inherited from her husband once she killed him, and her access to the records. Um, in terms of, I'm sorry, Judge, there was, I know there was something else. Well, there was a circumstantial the evidence. The fact that, you know, there, there is, this is a case where there's no, um, no evidence um, establishing that she was present when he was murdered. There's no physical well, evidence from her. There's um, no statements. So why don't you speak to those, the circumstantial aspect of this case? Um, I will. Um, I just re remember the last part of the answer that I was supposed to give, but I can go. <laughs> you can just go to that and then go back to the question. Okay. With regard to That's certain. fine. Let me just say that the mother's testimony seemed like a bunch of absolute nonsense. Her boyfriend, who we interviewed later, said she was not in debt. There was this notion that the defendant was going to say, well, she was in debt to some really bad people. And so not only did and I had to do this. And by the way, my husband knew that just doesn't pass a straight face test. And given other witnesses we talked to was pretty easy to refute. In terms of the circumstantial evidence, it's actually a pretty strong circumstantial case. By her own admission, she is there in the office moments before he was was killed. Like she puts herself there because she, she shows up with her, um, with her mail uh, box and she makes sure that the doorman sees her. She, and then even her statements later were, oh yeah, he came back and he said he was gonna work and we left. So she actually puts herself right at the scene. Then there's the fact that she behaved very oddly during this period of time. Then there's the fact that um, she needed all this money. And magically, once the defendant is dead, this money is, is made available that allows her to pay off her debts, allows her to pay off the tax collector, keep the company should she realize it. And then, of course, there's the DNA from her co-defendant, who is very close to her. So his presence at the location is actually evidence of her presence at the location. There was all sorts of evidence showing that the two of them were very close. They were um, preparing together by asking, uh, checking into certain things about the security in the building. For instance, was there a security camera? There appears that she gave uh, Mr. Wald her swipe card to get in early on the morning of the um, uh, murder, which is something that as far as anybody knew, had not been done. And certainly that, that week, all the records suggested something else. Um, so, you know, it's certain, and her statement to the babysitter was, we have to meet with Howard. We're going over some business uh, stuff that we have to talk to him about. But then she, and then she calls the babysitter several times and says, we're still not done yet. When she talks to the cops, all of a sudden it's, no, no, Howard and uh, Mr. Walls went to work out. They left me here alone. 
Then they came back and we left quickly after that. I mean, those are two very, very different explanations of what happened in the office. And you don't make those kind of, give those kind of uh, inconsistent explanations if the truth will, will, uh, will aid you. Um, Thank you. I, uh, uh, Unless there are any further questions, I'm sorry, I rest on my brief. Okay, thank you. Mr. Yeah. Tolkien, we're back to you. Yeah. You have two minutes. To. Thank you, Your Honor. First, dealing with the, uh, the babysitter very quickly. The people alleged that she was not forthcoming. That is not in the record. It's far from it. She said that the police didn't ask me these certain questions. She wasn't holding anything back. So this intelligent person, if she had this information, would have provided it to the police at that time. Nobody's going to be questioned by the police about a murder and not provide important information about the murder. In no way did she not provide it at that point in time if she had it. So it, for them to say that, that she was withholding is equivalent with them not asking the questions is crucial because them not asking the questions, that's on the people. That's their fault. That's their cause, and it's was not- Was this brought out during the trial? Yes, it was a So you had clear. a jury there. I mean, I understand. This is circumstantial evidence case, long time uh, from the time the murder happened, but you had a jury of 12 people capable yeah. of listening to all of this evidence. That's, that's correct, except, Judge, in this case, the Court of Appeals has said on numerous occasions, and they've used strong language, cases that are purely circumstantial require strict judicial supervision because it's dangerous. It's dangerous that we'll have wrong- Did you not have- yeah. No, okay. from the appellate court. From the appellate court on review for, for uh, sufficiency, excuse me, for against the weight of the evidence. And they say that the reason that exists, and they use these words, because it's dangerous. It's dangerous that inferences can be drawn well, from the evidence. Well, you should be confident that we are going to review it very strictly and carefully as we do with every case. And, and, and Your Honor, and what I, the reason I bring out that it's dangerous is that because the, in a fully circumstantial case, the people have the extra requirement to disprove that the evidence can be, be viewed in a light of innocence as of well as any theory of the defendant's innocence. That's what they deficiency not, is. But which they did, which they did not do during that trial. It's not a case with legal sufficiency where they take it in the light most favorable of people, as they tried to argue in their brief. It's a it's almost the opposite. They have to overcome a hurdle to you, the, this court, the second jury, and in deciding whether or not there's sufficient evidence. And and just in in, in closing, you just have to think about think about this case. It's brought, it's a, it is a circum, purely circumstantial evidence case, meaning we have those dangers that the Court of Appeals has pointed out. Uh, and they're that you've stated repeatedly and that we're aware of. Second, they bring it 21 years later, violating her due process rights. And then third, in a case where inferences are everything, on summation, the people summed up by asking the jury to speculate about matters so important about the murder weapon, where there was no testimony that a murder weapon was recovered, or even what the murder weapon was. And they offered a propensity argument against the defendant. So those the, the effect of those improper arguments are exacerbated by it being a circumstantial evidence case because they're relying solely on inferences that are being made. So yes, the jury was there, but the jury, and by the way, these were all objected to and overruled, and then, may, and then later uh, the, the court agreed with my ruling on the propensity argument. But the each time that they made an improper argument, it had an exponential effect upon the jury unfairly to the defendant because of the circumstantial effect and because they failed to bring this case for 21 years. Thank you, counsel. Thank you both. Thank you. And uh, be sure that we will take a very close look at this case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I'm going to go back now to the previous case because counsel wasn't able to get on. So that's G Builders versus Bondex. Good afternoon. Uh, can everybody hear me this time? <laughs> Not so well, but um, if you can speak up a little bit or increase the volume. Sure. Um, may it please the court. My name is Josh Deal and I'm here on behalf of appellants. Um, in this case, we were left with genuine factual disputes regarding the amounts that my client was actually paid for its work on the project, and that precludes summary judgment here. Um, 
Mr. Deal, this is Justice Kennedy, but didn't the plaintiff sign a final uh, release acknowledging that all amounts had been paid here? Um, the, the final release was not signed by my client. That, that was signed by the Damon G. Douglas, entity, who was the construction manager on the project, Your Honor. Um, and, and that reflects that all amounts were, were paid through that entity. Uh, however, my client was providing uh, project management services to Damon G. Douglas on this project uh, for which we had separate invoices. But your client took over the, well, I won't say took over, at least took over the accounts and was using, um, was controlling the count, the accounts of DGD. So they were writing checks on the accounts. They were paying the other subcontractors on the accounts. So they had the ability, they knew what money was coming in and they knew, they knew how much money came in. Yeah. And the amount of money that came in was calculated, I think, by the lower court to be $1,121,137, which is over the amount that they had agreed to. And by the way, was there a written agreement here with regard to HRH? Uh, yes, Your Honor. There, there was a written agreement between the parties. and For HRH. I know there was a written agreement for Adelphi with the, uh, on the Adelphi project. Yes, there's also a separate written agreement uh, between my client and DGD relating to the HRH project, and that is reflected at, um, I believe it's uh, page okay. uh, 204 of the record, Your Honor. Thank you. But what about the fact that they took over even writing the checks and they got all of the money and distributed it? Sure, Your Honor. Well, my client uh, took over the accounts to pay the subcontractors and to pay requisition for work performed for the actual construction. Um, that well, they, were, they had complete control of the accounts at that point. So they were paying for whatever had to be done within that period of time. Uh, I, to an extent, Your Honor, that's, that's true. But the, the checks that were relied upon by the court below were all checks paid to my client by DGD during a certain period of time. Uh, not necessarily checks related specifically to the services provided on this project. Uh, and Wait, there were 21 checks that came in. They all went in through DGD. Your client had access to all of them and control over all of them because it was part of the assets that came in. Well, the the checks themselves, some were were signed off by uh, my client's personnel who um, were controlling the the account, uh, but that's that does not necessarily mean that my client was overpaid or paid up. Um, my client could only pay out money that it actually received from the owner on the project. And my client made sure that the subcontractors were paid in accordance with the trust fund provisions of the lien law uh, before uh, settling out the account. Uh, I, I think that the issue is, is a little different when it comes to payment for services rendered by my client to Damon G, uh, G. Douglas um, for actually providing the, the service of, of maintaining those, those trust accounts. Um, and the, the record reflects that we have invoices for those services at a little over a million dollars, and the checks that were submitted, only $740,000, give or take, um, actually ties out and specifically pays. Are you talking about the construction, uh, payment for the construction of HRH, or payment for taking control of the 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 books and the checking account. Well, to be clear, Your Honor, the, the contract between my client and DGD was to provide the project management services that DGD was previously providing. Um, and we were doing that as a subcontractor. So right. the invoices we submitted to DGD were compensation for those services. Um, now, there, there was also some actual construction work 
completed by my client um, in, in the late stages of the project to close it out. But the, the actual work being performed here was um, project management services. And, and so that was separate from the... Uh, I still don't see how you account for the fact that you got in money that was more than the amount that you agreed for to. Sure, um, Your Honor. And, and to that point, the, the checks received uh, that actually go to pay invoices issued by my client uh, specifically reference those invoices for payment. The numbers tie out. They, uh, they're in exact amounts. They reference the, the invoice numbers, whereas a lot of these checks have nothing to do with the services provided. The You're talking about the six checks. You're talking about six checks, am I right? That's correct, Your Honor. As, as detailed in the opening brief, there are six checks that do not specifically tie out to any of the uh, invoices that were submitted. And many of them appear to be for uh, incidental costs and, and things that it, it's not really clear that, that it arises out of the HRH project. Um, and as you previously mentioned, our well, counsel, this is Judge Scarpula. Of, of anyone, you're you're the one most likely to know what those checks are all about. So how is it that you don't? How is it that you say we don't know what it is when you're controlling the checkbook? That makes zero sense, right? Well, Your Honor, I, I don't believe that the the details of each of these checks were fully discussed in deposition or or, or truly reflected in the record in a clear way. Um, and, and to be frank, the, the record's a bit chaotic, but... Uh, well, who, who issued the six checks? Wasn't that done by the sister of, um, of one of the people who worked for you? Um, the, I mean, you had control over every... Your client, I mean, had control over everyone who was writing the checks. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's the case on all of these six checks at issue, Your Honor, but uh, certainly for some of the checks, um, you can see that the, the signature there is uh, a, an agent of, of my client, um, but it, it does not necessarily mean that my client, uh, you know, somehow controlled the funds that, that were coming into Damon G. Douglas uh, I, I'm well. I'm speaking to the fact that you're saying you don't know anything about the checks, but the checks were written by the people who worked for you. Let's hear from your opposing counsel, Mr. Bittiger. Bittiger, sorry, you're muted, sir. You're still muted. Thank you, Your Honor. And Bittiger or Bittiger, I've been called much worse. So thank you very much. Well, I only like to call people by the name. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. May it please the court. Um, uh, and before I get into uh, three points that I really wanted to focus on and highlight here today, before before getting into them, I just want to kind of uh, amplify some of the questions that your honors had asked um, appellant's counsel. I believe the first question was relative to uh, the, the correct uh, correctly pointing out that there were uh, a, there was a final release waiver of lien and contractor's affidavit of payment. Um, that was executed on January 17th, 2017. That was specifically for the release of the balance of the retainage um, on that project. As an interesting side note, and um, it, during the course of litigation, the person that executed that, I, I know counsel indicated that that was something that was signed by Damon G. Douglas. Um, the person who signed that, the signatory, is a man by the name of Pat Skolecki. And during the course of discovery, uh, Mr. Skolecki is identified as an employee of um, G Builders. Um, and in this case, Your Honors, uh, this is a classic case of G Builders stepping in the shoes and taking over for a principal in every respect. Damon G. Douglas was the construction manager for this project. Uh, this is a surety claim, as the court is aware. Um, Bondex Companion had absolutely no. Uh, uh, knowledge of G Builder's involvement in this matter at all, nor did they have any knowledge that D Damon G. Douglas was in any uh, 
anyway having problems completing their obligations on the project until receiving the bond claim, which incidentally, as another sidebar, was submitted on Damon G. Douglas letterhead and signed by George Figliolia as executive. Mr. Figliolia, your honors may, uh, that may ring a bell. He identifies himself as the executive of G Builders. Um, this is, you could not step in the shoes of another separate entity more so than what G Builders have done here. Um, the, so with regard to the three points that I wanted to emphasize, first with regard to the specific finding that Judge Bannon found on the motion for summary judgment relative to the reason why the, uh, count three of the complaint was dismissed, and that was finding that, as your honors uh, were asking counsel, that G Builders was actually paid in excess of what they invoiced for the, for the project. Uh, the, going back to paragraph 16 of the original complaint in this matter, G Builders indicated that they billed DGD $1,020,727.43 for the services that they had agreed to. Uh, during the course of discovery, however, we checks were produced that indicated that they DGD uh, paid or through DGD accounts, G Builders was paid more than $1,120,000. So essentially, that is $100,000 more than the prayer for relief on the original complaint. Now, for the first time on this appeal, your honors, uh, G Builders is alleging that the amount that they actually invoiced the principal was $1,889,526.23, which is a difference of $900,000. This is not a small clerical error. This is a significant amount. This is not an argument that was advanced at any point. Uh, it wasn't alleged in a complaint and was never advanced at any point before the trial court. Um, as I indicated in our brief, it is respectfully requested that this um, that argument and those proofs be disregarded by this court as it's being raised for the first time in uh, in accordance with the applicable New York uh, precedent. Um, the other thing that plaintiffs have pointed to uh, at different points to kind of create confusion is their involvement on a separate project with DGD at the same time, and that was with regard to Adelphi University. And as a, I presumably to try to cast doubt on you know all the payments that were being received by G Builders from DGD accounts that they weren't all attributable to this HRH Care project, um, they point they they raise that issue. However, as indicated in our brief, plaintiff's executive George Figliolia testified during his deposition that Adelphi dual party checks to all of the subcontractors, including G Builders. They were paid directly because by that point, unlike the HRH Care project, apparently the principals at Adelphi did not have confidence in DGD's accounting practices and the payment of their subcontractors and material men. Um, in addition, the former president, CEO, and chairman of the board of Damon G. Douglas, which is Samuel Prisco, he indicated in his affidavit of August 29th, 2018, that plaintiffs were being paid di directly on the Adelphi job. So Thank you. if you just wrap up your thoughts. I, I, I definitely wrap up that. Your Honor, the two other points that that were that were not that Judge Bannon didn't need to get to, and I will not argue them here, but I would just like ask the court to keep in mind there was a notice requirement as expressly provided under the bonds, uh, and there's a concern with regard to the timeliness. And then with regard to G, uh, G Builders uh, standing as an actual subcontractor as compared to a completion contractor uh, with notice Thank to the burden. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Mr. Deal. Thank you. Um, just quickly, Your Honors, um, I, I'd like to emphasize that the, the issue about the total invoicing of 1.8 million was never uh, an issue below because it, it was never fully discussed. It, it wasn't really a dispute. Um, our, our client issued a final invoice that reconciled the insurance costs that reflects the total uh, billing on the project. This includes the one million and, and change that was um, invoiced for the services provided, whereas the, there are other charges that relate to materials and, and labor and, and things of that nature that were provided. Now, the the math on all of this just doesn't 
make any any sense. And and unfortunately, the the record's a, a bit chaotic on that issue. However, it, the fact is, we didn't control the money coming into DGD's accounts. So regardless of you know what my client knew when about how much money there was, it doesn't change the fact that my client was still owed money and was unpaid money because there wasn't enough in the account to pay them. Um, so at the end of the day, we we have two stories here about um, how these payments were allocated. One in which we have a little over a million in, in service invoices to which 740,000 were directly paid against those invoices. And we have a world in which we were inexplicably overpaid for our invoices for services, but underpaid for our total uh, billings on the project. Um, in, in that world, there's not enough in the record either way to say what uh, what amounts we were actually paid for the, the services invoices, what these checks went to uh, to pay for, whether it was services, work on the project or something else, or work on the Adelphi project. There's simply not enough in the record to make a definitive ruling of Thank you. judgment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Your Honors. International Pathways versus University of Queensland. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Good afternoon. I'm Good afternoon. Um, I'm Carmen Saparic on behalf of uh, Appellant International Pathways, Inc. Um, back in uh, 2008, uh, my client, uh, IPI, introduced a unique medical education program to respondents, uh, University of Queensland in Australia and, and the Ochsner Health System in, in Louisiana. Uh, this resulted in the signing of an affiliation agreement that remained in, in place until its expiration date of December uh, 2019. Um, that's when respondents allegedly ended the program by not renewing it. Uh, with IPI and supposedly initiated a new program without IPI. We contend that no such end of the program occurred and that in fact the respondents continue uh, to un uh, unlawfully run the same pre-expiration date program in breach of the agreement. Pursuant to, um, if I might, uh, pursuant to section 9.3, um, as you said, the program expired. They didn't terminate it. Um, right. Under that, under 9.3, were they supposed to continue the program um, to, for the purposes of the students? It says the parties agreed to work together to create a transition plan to end the program. So were they supposed to be continuing the program for the purposes of not leaving students sort of high and dry sort of without Yes, any Your Honor. Okay. How, how did that? Yes. Okay. So the students who were already enrolled and were already in the program, either at the um, University of Queensland in, in Australia or in their clinical program at Ashner, um, they had to continue that program for their benefit. Um, not only so when you say so, when you say uh, end, are you talking about that or something no. else? I'm talking about the actual provision of the of 9.3 where it says that they must implement a transition plan that ends the program in a reasonable manner, consistent with AMC uh, requirements, regulatory requirements. AMC has very strict regulatory requirements. AMC requires, um, that's the, the Australian Medical Council, they require a notice of intent to end a program to be filed 20 months before the end of a program. And if a new program is to be uh, developed, they require 24 month uh, notice of intent to uh, uh, develop a new program. That wasn't done. There's, there's been some communication uh, with the regulatory uh, agencies and um, they've indicated that they won't be ready to launch their new program until 2025. I guess that's coincidental with the time that existing students will be graduating. It's around the, that same time. But in the meantime, they have enrolled new students um, uh, they have created what they believe or what they maintain is a new program, which we claim is cannot be a new program because they never ended the old program pursuant to section 
uh, 9.3. Um, this whole argument revolves around the definition of the word end. And end means end, it means a, a terminal point, a point where everything ceases to exist, where it concludes, where it finishes. And, and even you know, respondents say that it means to wind down. Wind down means to bring something to an end. So, Council, so, this is Judge Scarpula. The agreement yes. under 9.1 says it's going to expire on December 31st, 2019, unless the parties agreed in writing. So it expires. There's, it there's expires. Yes. Right. Did the parties agree in writing to renew for five years? No. So the agreement no. expired on the December agreement expired. 31st, 2019, right? There's no, you don't have to, you don't have to send any notice. 9 1 no, says, no, in that circumstance, it just expires. No. There's nothing more you have to do. You just have to let it end, right? The notice has to go to AMC, to the Australian Medical Council. Well, we have to read 9.1 okay, together that, with 9.1. That, that section has to do with discretionary termination, right? Not no. termination at the end of the contract. No. Um, is not, isn't 9.3 discretionary termination? Um, 9.3 is, is um, to read that, <clears throat> in the event that this agreement is not renewed after the initial term, which is what happened here, or any renewal term, or any party terminates pursuant to 9.2. So it, it covers both uh, 9.1 and 9.2. And it sets forth the provisions and the requirements that the parties have to follow. And they have to follow, they have to cooperate to implement this transition plan that ends the program in a responsible manner, consistent with AMC and, and other requirements, and uh, enable the participants uh, in the program to continue on to be taught through graduation and and thirdly to resolve any financial or other outstanding disputes that they may have. Um, so what we contend here is that it didn't end properly because in order for it to end to either terminate or to or to expire because remember 9.3 covers both 9.1 and 9.2 endings. So no it, it has to be done parties have to um, reasonably end it consistent with the AMC requirements, and that was not done here. Um, so what we what we maintain is that we sufficiently pled that, that uh, the court did not, this was a pre-answer 3211 motion to dismiss, and, and the trial court was required to um, give our complaint a liberal construction. They were required to accept the allegations as true, and and to provide the plaintiffs with the benefit of every favorable interest. May I ask you one more question? Is sure. your argument that the breach was not sending that letter to the the whatever it is in, in Australia, the Australian authority? That was the is that the breach you're alleging? The breach is that they did not comply with 9.3 and 9.3. In what way? That's what I'm, I need. Mean well, that's one point. way. That's one way they failed to comply so, by not I sending. I don't see that allegation in your complaint. That's that's my issue. Uh, all right. The, the the complaint as as originally drafted had <clears throat> five causes of action. Um, of, we're not asking that the first cause of action be reinstated. We're only asking that the, the second and fourth causes of action be reinstated. The, uh, the third and fifth stayed in. Um, those are before Judge Ostrager now. Um, the second, Bad faith, yeah. you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't complete the, you know, whatever, the, the process. Those are still in. I'm just those curious. are still in. That's been stayed. That's before Justice Ostrager. That's been stayed. Um, discovery, that, that has, the, the answer has not been filed. Um, the trial court is waiting to hear what happens here at, at the court, um, and, and then the, um, uh, there'll be an answer uh, filed, and, and discovery will um, uh, hopefully include at that time. But we maintain that the causes of action, as, as uh, described in the complaint, um, were well pleaded that the court should have given us um, every favorable inference. Um, it, it did not do so. It dismissed these the two breach of contract causes of action, um, breach of contract provision 9.3, um, 
And we're asking that, that you reinstate those two causes of action so we can go forward with discovery and, and dispositive motions. Uh, we believe that the court below unjustifiably and erroneously cut off um, our clients' ability to proceed with these claims in this early pre-answer stage of the proceedings. Um, Thank you. In the alternative, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry if I thought you were done. In the alternative, oh, you were saying? Uh, in the alternative, if you find that um, our position is, is reasonable and open to countervailing possible interpretations, which is the language uh, Judge Scarpula, you made an earlier reference today to Dwayne Reed, um, then we would ask you to, to find an ambiguity and remand for trial on, on the issue of the intent of the parties at the time of the formation of the contract. Thank you. Counsel for the respondent? Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. Lisa Bebchik from Ropes and Gray on behalf of the respondents. I'd like to take a quick step back and provide some context to IPI's claims on appeal here. IPI's claims are designed to try to keep the affiliation agreement alive, despite the fact that it had a finite end to it, as Justice Scarpula was honing in on. IPI's primary claim of breach in its complaint was that respondents acted in bad faith by letting the agreement expire by its terms and starting a new program without IPI. They cl IPI I, I just want to ask you, if, you know, as you give your answer, if you would um, keep in mind that these are very early stages. This is the pre-answer stage. So we are not supposed to give a liberal con con review of the plaintiff's position and the claims here. Um, so just keep that in mind as you give your answer. Absolutely, Your Honor. And and I think the trial court stretched to afford this complaint every favorable inference. And that's demonstrated by the fact that the trial court sustained the, the barely pled mismanagement claims here. Um, the IPI claimed that the party's reasonable expect expectations was that this agreement would be renewed after its initial 10-year term. It's an over, over a decade this agreement has been in effect that it would be extended for at least 20 years. But that claim was dismissed by the trial court and, and IPI has abandoned that bad faith claim on appeal. So what it's left with is this claim under section 9.3. But 9.3 is not a provision design, designed to prevent post agreement um, uh, restrictions. It's not designed to present, prevent the medical parties from starting new programs. If the, if, if that, we, there's a provision in the agreement. Was there that, supposed to be an end to this program? I mean, this is not um, this is not a self-standing, a different program. This is a, a program. It seems that new uh, participants entered before the existing participants or students concluded. Um, is that an end uh, of the program? I mean. I guess, of course, they could start another program that did, doesn't have that two-year uh, preclusion that I guess is in um, 9.2 if you terminate. But is this an end to the original program, or is this just a blending together uh, of the old with your, a, a brand new one? Yeah, as, as your honor mentioned, in, in section 9.4, there there is an express restriction from parties commencing uh, post-agreement uh, starting a new program post agreement, but but th th that's not applicable here. What what um, your honor is getting at is that there there is what section point three nine point three is designed to do. It's designed to protect students if they're enrolled in the in the program prior to to the expiration and the agreement expires. They may have three years left of studies left in their program. So this provision is designed to say. All parties, not just the medical entities, all parties need to get together, cooperate, design and, and implement a program in a reasonable manner that's consistent with the, the AMC and other, other accreditation bureaus, quality standards, so that those students can graduate. And the to end the, but that program is to, supposed to end, right? Exactly. It ends when that last student who is enrolled prior to the agreement's expiration graduates. And, and and that program ends, but but nine three has nothing to do with restricting the medical entities from doing anything after the agreement has expired, which it has. And and I. But the question is is whether or not the new, whatever it is that 
has begun where new students are being taken in, um, if that is in conjunction with the existing students, if that's in conjunction with the existing program. It, it, it's not, Your Honor. The, the existing program, uh, the, the agreement, the affiliation agreement that governed the, the program between the three parties, between o Oshner, UQ, and IPI, that agreement expired on December 31st, 2019. 9-3 is the mechanism by which the program winds down. We use the word wind down. The word- And, and so here's my question. So the winding down of the program has to happen over the next three years or whatever it is that will allow the, the student in the first year, let's say, to graduate. And there's another program already up and running. Is that program, is it, um, are those, are this, the new students in that program also in the same classes and everything with the existing students? Well, the new students that are enrolled post-December 31st, 2019 are enrolled pursuant to a totally separate affiliation agreement that has nothing to do with IPI. And, and it, it, it's, has, it, it, it's not the same program. It's, if, as the trial court in its well-reasoned decision uh, said that the definition of program that IPI is trying to rely upon is far too narrow and, and, it, and it's uh, illogical, right? It, this is a, an agreement that is between all three parties. And if you look at the recital paragraphs in the agreement, it's clear that the agreement contemplates that the program, the affiliation agreement is talking about is a program with all three parties. Council, this is Judge Kennedy, and I have two quick questions for you. Um, was there anything in the agreement that required any party to actually state forth a basis for not renewing the agreement? And also, did any party actually have to state uh, the program is ended if it wasn't renewed? To answer your first question, Justice Kennedy, uh, no, and that's why the the first cause of action was dismissed by the trial court. The agreement just expired by, by its own terms. It, it was a long and by IPI's own complaint, very successful program where the, the parties made a lot of money um, and, and, and through the revenue share. Um, and, and I'm sorry, Your Honor, your second question was- uh, Oh, I'll state it again. Was there any requirement to actually state, you know, if it's not gonna be renewed, the program is ended? The only requirement set forth in 9.3 is that the parties collectively uh, get together, cooperate, develop a transition plan, and implement it so that students can graduate. And the only conceivable way that that it uh, could implement, it could possibly be uh, protecting IPI is 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 in subsection C, where it says that the parties should resolve any outstanding financial matters, and and so. Um, but but other than that, there, it's just 9.4, very clearly the parties knew how to restrict the medical entities from starting a new program after the agreement expired, and, and they didn't do it. And this is um, a really a distortion of section 9.3 to, to say that it does the same thing as 9.4. Thank you. All right, just, just briefly. Um, two minutes. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just briefly, Your Honors. Um, We've never seen this new affiliation agreement, so uh, the defendants have failed to describe a new program for us. As far as we know, uh, it's the same exact program. Um, they've indicated on their website that they've made some tweaks and there may be some new curriculum changes in 1922. Um, and as I said earlier, the program won't, the new program won't be in effect until 2025. That's why we need discovery. That's why this has to proceed. I mean, we were acting blindly. We had asked. Uh, uh, we had asked the, the other side for these affiliation agreements, the new ones, they refused to turn them over. We've never seen them, so we don't know what what agreements they're operating uh, under and, and what agreements under which they enroll their new students. Um, that's why we're entitled to discovery. Um, I believe that what's happening here is that the defendants are pushing form over substance. Um, Section 9.3, yes, of course, it, it, it uh, protects the students, the already enrolled students, but it also protects the parties against any future liability. The parties represented to these students that they would get 
a, a medical degree at the end of his four-year term after concluding two years at Queen, Queensland, two years in, in Louisiana, and that they would get their medical degree. Um, so it protects the parties, both all parties, all three parties to the to the affiliation agreement. Um, Excuse me, counsel. Yes. Uh, a very quick question. Um, yes, Judge. The after the after the expiration of this contract, um, nine point three, uh, assuming a transition plan was put in place, you can argue that maybe it wasn't done the right way, et cetera, as you argued earlier. Um, does IPAI have a continuing role? after the expiration vis-a-vis -vis those students that were involved in the program before the expiration of this contract to ensure, uh, as you just stated, that well, they, they get to the finish line in terms yeah. of getting an, an accredited medical, medical education and all the other bells and whistles that will enable them to practice in the United States? Yeah, well, they've been cut out. So th they've been cut out. Um, so, um, and they haven't been involved in, in, in any cooperative fashion with, with um, the respondents here to develop this program to, to end, um, develop a transition plan to, that would end the program according to uh, uh, medical um, AMC requirements. So I can't answer that at this I point see. because it's not, it's not in the, it's not in the, um, in the agreement. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Yep, thank you. People versus Jonathan Ramirez. Yes, Your Honor, this is Brian Davis for the appellant. Yes, you may begin. Thank you, Judge. Um, as as you are all aware, this is a uh, this is a defendant charged and convicted on two uh, B felony assaults. Um, one of the uh, victim's name is uh, Jimmy Garcia. That's the, the assault that took place in this hotel room crowded with about 40 to 50 young people uh, drinking, partying. Uh, the other assault is on um, Mr. Uh, Carlos Gomez, which occurs out in the, in the hall. I want to address the, the assault on Mr. Garcia first. There's absolutely no evidence that shows um, the defendant hitting, striking, kicking, you know, using a bottle on Mr. Garcia. The closest they come is this aiding and abetting theory. And as you, you know from these, you know, the, the confused uh, testimony, because everybody has their own little story. Um, the defendant is on the couch. He gets hit by one of the, um, one of Mr. Garcia's friends. He goes over the couch onto the floor, and then this thing breaks out. The closest they have is Garcia putting his hands out in front of him, waving his hands twice like that. That was the motion that's described on the record. Nothing really can be discerned in his hands, certainly no type of large weapon, just that back and forth motion. And I believe the theory is that he was trying to keep people off of, of what was happening to Garcia behind him. But, but clearly he was just assaulted himself. Why isn't that just as consistent with him defending himself? Um, the other testimony from the friends of Mr. Garcia is that they never see uh, Garcia. He's in the vicinity, but they don't see any weapons in his hands and they don't see him do anything to Mr. Garcia on the ground. Then it ends inside. Garcia goes out into the hallway. He's with his friends. And then for whatever reason, he goes back to the door, starts banging on the door. I guess he wants to get back in and set things straight. The door opens. Somebody reaches out, pulls him in. The door closes and we don't know what happens in the room except that Garcia was was beaten. The one person identified through all this is Mr. Delgado, of course. Mr. Delgado had the braided hair, short, you know, fat, rotund. Uh, he had the bottle in his hand, but no one sees it in in Garcia's hands. So on on that charge, the argument is there's insufficient evidence. You're really just speculating uh, as to what happened in the room, who who beat Mr. Garcia when he was in the room, and certainly that movement as I that I made that gesture with the hands in front without showing that there's a weapon or anything else after after the defendant was assaulted is insufficient to establish um, enough evidence to convict him of that B felony. Turning to the Mr. assault Davis, on this is Justice Kennedy, yes, what wasn't there yes, also Judge. evidence that um, um, defendant you know stood over? Uh, 
Garcia while he was on the floor and then, you know, Delgado had hit him with the bottle because one of the witnesses, you know, said he, uh, you know, uh, wanted to intervene. He stopped him and then also stood over um, Delgado. I'm sorry, Garcia, please forgive me. Judge, don't don't worry. I've been struggling with these names for a year. You know, <laughs> they, once you get... You, you think you know them, and then there's little. I think the Carlos G's go Carlos together. And... That's what I've discovered. Yeah. The G's go together, Garcia but, and Gomez. Right, Judge, you're right. But and and it's in it's in our brief. We concede he's there, but you know, it's the old presence at the scene of a crime isn't enough. I mean, this is. A, I think it's a madhouse. I, I wish defense counsel had 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 built up and 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 asked more questions concerning. I, I look at it as one of these. These um, spring breaks where everybody's milling around each other, everybody's standing there. I don't think just standing there is enough. You know, it, it, the, the, the thing broke out inside. Um, as I said, the, the worst my guy did was, was wave his hands in front as, as a couple of the friends were coming towards him. And right after that, probably within 10 seconds, he's standing over Garcia. But again, even Garcia's friend says he didn't do any kicking or hitting or punching and didn't have a bottle in his hand. So I don't think there's enough there on on Garcia inside. And of course, we have Gomez out in the out in the hallway. Um, and I think um, our point three on the brief, the duplicative the confusion is that uh, Mr. Gomez suffered some injuries inside and then he suffers the injury outside. And I know the testimony is that as he walks out of the 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 hotel room. First, he says, I got struck by a bottle. And then it's, I think it was, I think it was the defendant. And then he's prodded by the prosecutor and then says, yeah, well, it, it was the defendant. Um, at the same time, the big Carlos, Carlos Madrigal, says that he was the one who was hit. So there is a, there is some confusing testimony out there. Granted, a jury can, can, can make a determination. But but the defense maintains that there's two assaults here on Gomez. There was some assault. He was some injuries inside, and then he suffers the injury outside. And but Mr. Davis, the these, people didn't charge a defendant with the assault inside. Only in in the lobby. And certainly Gomez was quite clear that uh, when he tried to enter the elevator, the defendant hit him above the right eye with a bottle. And he identified him in court. That's clear. Uh, as I said, w w he needed some prodding. I mean, it was, I think, I know that's a term of art, but I think it was him. And then the prosecutor, you know, there was an objection by the defense attorney. Then the prosecutor says, you think, well, it was the defendant. But well, I think there, there's there's one, one, follow one more point, because obviously the defendant was wearing some distinctive clothing. He had the pink uh, uh, yeah, shirt the on. He had the, the hat. hat, right? Everyone identified what he was wearing. So did uh, Mr. Gomez, and he identified him. I know, Judge. I mean, it's, it was, I, I know the jury can certainly rely upon that, and that's why I thought uh, our third point, to, because I know he did suffer some injury inside. I, I think those things were, you know, conflated to, to, that a jury could say, what are we going to convict him of? The, the assault out here or the assault in the apartment? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rivelisse. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Vincent Rivelisse for the people. So uh, the first assault, I think, is the closer question. That's Garcia inside. And that's because the defendant wasn't alleged to have personally delivered any of the, the force or the uh, injury. But he was acting in concert with the others. And the second assault on Gomez is also part of well, the Well, just to that overall. point, to that point, as counsel says, um, this the defendant was the one who was first hit, wasn't he? I mean, he's the one who's getting he's struck first. And so yes. why isn't that then his moving his hands around to defend himself or protect himself or challenge somebody who may be coming after him? I know that the testimony or so what it said is that, well, they were trying to go help the person who was being hit, who was on the floor. But this person, the defendant, was just hit. So why wasn't that consistent with his defending himself? I mean, he's charged with a, a gang assault a, a, that, that has a minimum of five years. 
Yes. Well, he made the strategic decision not to pursue justification. This was specifically stated on the record right after the summations. But uh, as far as the beginning of the fight, it was a bit of a, a melee in the beginning. But I think what it boiled down to once it developed was the people with the bottles against the people without the bottles. And the people with the bottles won the fight and caused the injury. And the defendant didn't interpose a defense that he was justified in participating in that, which would maybe make sense because that was deadly weapons versus fists. Uh, to say what he did in the first fight, because it was less, and that's the closer question, it wasn't just that he swiped his hands back and forth before uh, trying to block somebody from joining in to help, but the, the person who he stopped from helping the victim demonstrated that the swiping back and forth. So the jury and the judge were able to see the motions that were said to be threatening to, to prevent the help. In addition, another witness, Perez, saw the defendant holding something shiny. There wasn't enough description whether it was a knife or a bottle, but something shiny. So that suggested he was among the side with the weapons and also trying to stop Garcia from being helped. And then the third thing is that when uh, Garcia Didn't was- Didn't he say something? Wasn't there some testimony about a, a sparkler? I, I don't even know. It was something, I mean, there was, that's complete speculation, isn't it? To suggest that it was shiny, so it was a weapon. I mean, it never was used. He never attempted to use it. It was something shiny in his hand. I mean, well, no, one saw him, right. no one saw him use it, so we're not saying it was a knife. We're not saying what it was, but there was but, something But you just said, hand. but I, so he could be on the side with the weapons versus, I mean, that's a... It's a fair inference that he was on their side because he was stopping people from helping the victim on the ground who was getting hit by bottles. But we're not saying it was a knife or a bottle. We don't know what it was. The witness didn't say what it was. But it's just another little fact that the jury was aware of. And there was one additional fact, which was that when they were continuing to beat Garcia on the ground, the defendant was standing at his feet as part of the crowd that was preventing access to help Garcia. So this is something the jury had a right to consider. This was obviously not as strong as the Gomez assault, where the defendant was the one who hit him with the bottle. So obviously the first assault is the closer question, and we're not disputing that. But the jury had enough to go on to find that he was guilty of that. And we can consider the entire course of events, which is that he stayed with those assaulters of Garcia leaving the apartment, and that they were around when he was assaulting Gomez with the bottle himself, where he's the one who hit the bottle, and that the perpetrators then left altogether. And, you know, as a group, that all of that together was reason for the jury to conclude that he was acting in concert for the first assault, and the second assault that he perpetrated mostly by himself with the others around was much clearer. So for that reason, we believe that the evidence was sufficient and that the jury properly credited the evidence of finding him guilty of the assaults. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Mr. Davis. Yes, Judge. Uh, just just to finish up, I think you made the point. Um, yeah, remember, he was just assaulted. I, as you I don't know. make the point. <laughs> I asked the question. Oh. It's your job. Well, no, but point, you, you addressed something about the, being something in his hand. Nobody can say for sure what it was, if there was anything. I mean, it could be water on his hands that's that, that's sparkling. I mean, who knows? Um, and and just as, again, just standing over this person, I'm sure there were there were 25 people standing around looking at this at this person. Again, just the presence there alone is not enough uh, to establish that. And um, I'll I'll leave it there, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Happy okay. St. Patrick's Day to all. Thank you very much. Same to you, and thank, uh, you. thank you both. Thank you. Both. Thanks, Judge. Thank Joseph, um, I'm sorry. Jewish Press versus MTA. Mr. Aaron, I was about to call you instead of the case, but you're you're up. Okay, good afternoon, Your Honors. So this FOIL matter um, in front of Your Honors today really relates to two things. One is the MTA um, found one document that was responsive to the Jewish press's request, but still, notwithstanding, refused to produce it. The other aspect of this matter is whether or not what the MTA did arbitrarily searching in one department constitutes a diligent search under the statute and FOIL in 89.3. So I guess, um, oh, I'm I was, I'm sorry. I, um, I was going to ask about the response that they give, um, that um, these things are not indexed in a way that they can that enables them to identify and locate the documents, that it would either be too broad or too narrow. They can't, you know, identify them sufficiently. Is yes, that, right. yeah. yeah. Why so don't you speak to that? So, so through the briefing, there became this issue about reasonably described. 
the statute requires that a FOIL request be reasonably described. Now, case law from 30 years ago from uh, the Court of Appeals and is interpreted by the third department and the second department define reasonably described exactly that. It's not a term of art. It means did you give the agency enough information to understand what documents you're looking for? And in a recent decision, a uh, 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 appellate court said it's not to be conflated with burden. So in other words, there may be a separate analysis. I'm not saying that there's not. But reasonably described in of itself means, does the agency understand what the requester is looking for? And here, I don't believe that that's an issue because the MTA put in an affidavit that said it looked through the Jewish for, for the for the papers re requested by the Jewish press in their HR department. And in fact, they even found one document. Well, this is Judge Scarpula. It's, it has to do with how can we search for the documents? So they're, what they're saying is we don't have we don't have the documents compiled in a way that we can search for every single your request was any religious accommodation. That could be an oral conversation between an employee and the employer that's documented somewhere in an email, or it could be an HR form. But the, the objection was that your request doesn't correspond to a group of documents or a way of grouping documents that would be responsive. That's, so that's the problem, right? They can't, they can't respond because they can't search for what you've sought because the documents aren't indexed that way. Do you disagree with that? Do you think that they are indexed that way and they're just not saying it? I, I agree with everything you're saying, Your Honor, but as Judge Shankman said in the second department last year, that's a burden issue. The fact that they don't index their things properly plays to the analysis of what it's going to take for them to identify the documents, not whether or not it's reasonably described. If MTA says they know what the documents are, are, but it will take them a gazillion years, that's not a reasonably described argument, that's a burden argument. And, and that's Mr. Mr. Aaron, this is Justice Kennedy, and I know that you're relying on Jewish press, which I don't think is applicable here, because there, the argument was that the request was unduly, uh, unduly burdensome. That's not the argument here. The argument here is that they were not uh, reasonably described. And certainly in Jewish press, there the DOE conceded that they could identify and locate the documents. We don't have that here. So what I want to know is, did you present any evidence to refute that claim that uh, they didn't, you know, they couldn't categorize the index records by religious accommodation? Did you present anything to refute that claim? Because Jewish press is not applicable here. There's no concession that they know where the documents are or even that they identify the documents. And the claim here is not being unduly burdensome. It's not reasonably described. So Jewish press is, is not applicable. So the way I understand the affidavit put forward by the MTA is that we searched for those documents in the human resource department where with all probability there would be located and we only found one. But since they could be in other places, it's too much for us to just randomly look everywhere. Not the argument that we don't understand what you're looking for or the parameters of the search. That, that's not what the affidavit says, that we don't understand the parameters. It says the MTA has no procedures for religious accommodation. And therefore, it could be done in a department itself or it could be done centrally in HR. And since we don't have a set procedure, we only looked in HR and we could only find one. And for the rest, you know, we're not going to deal with it because it's too hard to figure out how to deal with it. That that that's why when I started, my my thought is that well, this counsel, really this is Judge Scarpool again. Is it that it's too hard to deal with it, or that or is it that the doc, there aren't documents indexed in a way that we can reasonably find them? So again, that's my that and, and are you saying that the documents are indexed so that they can reasonably find them? And that's that is not that there that assertion is false what do you, why how is what is your argument against that assertion so so it's really twofold to the extent they're in paper that searching arbitrarily in one department which they acknowledge they did the human resource department that's not adequate a diligent search but i'm also saying that they could do other things for example on their email server 
they could search keywords on the back end in an effort to locate them. Did and, you and offer any keywords, uh, Council? Did you offer any keywords? Or did you request, let's just focus on the emails? Well, 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 Justice Kennedy, the, 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 the way it went down for the Jewish press was, they, they never saw this affidavit like in every Article 78 under FOIL until, until you're in Supreme Court. So the Jewish press was bound by what happened in the administrative process. In the administrative process, they made a final determination saying- Oh, I know, I'm talking about before. I understand. I'm, no, the, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, no, no I, I understand, but I'm saying when you were requesting this, what did you do to try to narrow your request? No, well, they got the last say. The way it works is the Jewish press makes- I know how it works. I know how it works. I know how it works. So my understanding is there's nothing in the record where they were engaged by the MTA, which in fact, um, uh, uh, one of the FOIL regs under section 14 of the regs promulgated by Committee on Open Government actually places the burden on them that if it's an issue with defining keywords to reach out to the Jewish press. That's not the Jewish press's burden. In other words, it's not like interrogatories that it's for attorneys to draft the FOIL um, perfectly. They made a request and to the extent there's ambiguity in the request, it's not the Jewish press's burden. The agency is supposed to engage and say, hey, well, why don't you give us some keywords that we could effectively search for what you're looking. That never took place and the record demonstrates that. Thank you. Counsel for the respondent. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jason Douglas Barnes for the respondent. Um, I'd, I'd just like, like to, make to address first the issue that um, this is just um, MTA saying that um, it's too burdensome. It just, you know, we can't put in these keywords um, in different departments. It's just too much. Well, that's absolutely not the case, Your Honor. The bottom line is that as much as MTA would prefer to avoid disputes by simply turning over the documents under FOIL, it can't do so here. Um, affidavits submitted below reflect that the uh, MTA staff who has the best knowledge of this subject matter, which is obviously going to be the Human Resources Department, uh, were asked uh, to look into how these records were kept. They did so. As an experiment, they looked into their own records to see if they had anything. You know, they asked all of their own department, all 20 or so people. Um, that the number is not in the record, by the way. Um, to to search their records and find out what they found, and they came back and told the FOIL team that these records are not maintained uh, as a matter of policy uh, in any kind of formal way. It's just individual communications between employees and their supervisors. And employees can have multiple supervisors. Uh, they could be reflected in any kind of medium throughout the MTA, in emails, in paper, in phone calls, in text messages. We don't know. And so there's absolutely no way to search for these uh, records without either more information or some other kind of limiting, such as you know asking us to do a particular set of employees. Council, this is Judge Sparkula. Would, would the document say on the ray line religious accommodation? Not necessarily, Your Honor. Um, people aren't likely to use those magic words. In fact, uh, one of only the affidavits lawyers, submitted right? below. I'm sorry. <laughs> lawyers, are the only one, lawyers are the only ones who use that kind of word. People right, say, right. I need uh, St. Patrick's Day off. Or <laughs> That's a perfect example. I like to go to my niece's breasts or, or my nephew's breasts, sorry. And right. what, what makes it even more difficult to search is that the MTA cannot just invent these terms on behalf of, of petitioner uh, appellant here because well, they could constitute what, any number counsel, of religions. And I'm counsel, sorry. Let, me, let me just ask you this. You said that the MTA can't just invent this. So let's say that Jewish press said, okay, look up bris, look up Hanukkah, look up bar mitzvah, look up would you then say yes? If if it was limited to emails or some other, you know, sort of uh, more limited electronic search that we could actually do a search for that, then yes, you know, it would probably require paying an outside vendor at the Jewish press's expense, but we could absolutely do that if it were so limited. Um, any other questions on well, that point? Well, I didn't mean that it would be limited to four words. I mean, they it could be 100 various words. I'm saying if they gave a list of words, you're saying that could be done? Absolutely, Your Honor. Um, I, I don't know what the, uh, you know, 
what all of the technical limit limitations that may exist maybe because the question before us is not a list of 100 words and whether or right, not our sure. systems could possibly handle it that was a but general, a very broad general um uh request all requests for religious accommodations such as dress shifts etc uh by employees and dress shift those are not religious words of course um by employees and the result thereof so correct your honor um but in theory if, if we were given a list of 100 terms we could search for those terms and just give the responsive results after review um I, i'd like to just uh quickly uh address two other points um First, uh, in the interest of professional responsibility, I'd like to note that I, I, uh, I'd like to correct an error in my brief that has come to my attention. In a string citation on page 17, I completely incorrectly summarized the third department's holding in Stein versus State. Um, and I, I felt the need to bring that to your attention, Your Honor. Um, that said, it's distinguishable because it concerned a discrete set of indexed documents and unindexed documents that were already contained in a particular folder that the agency complained would be burdensome to review. Uh, it knew where the folder was, unlike uh, the MTA in this matter, where the documents could be anywhere. Um, I'm and glad second, you felt the need to bring that to our attention. It was the right thing to do. We will not hold it against you now, but that is what you should do. So thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And uh, to the Jewish press's point about if I still have time, um, the uh, Committee on Open Government's regulations, uh, those regulations existed in a very similar form at the time of Mitchell versus Slade, the first department's 1991 holding, which found, uh, which held that an agency is not required to solicit additional information from uh, a, a requester uh, in order to enable it to identify the documents. Um, what the regulation says uh, in its current form is that the agency is required to assist when appropriate. What that means exactly is unclear, but I don't think it puts the onus on the agency to fix a broken request. Thank you. Mr. Aaron, we're back to you. Okay, just a couple of points. Um, you know, to the, to the extent that the court finds it to be a reasonably described issue, what it would do is clearly create a divide between this department and the second department. Now, to the extent that this court finds it's a burden issue, I happen to have seen less than a month ago, um, Justice Renwick, you and Justice Shulman um, rendered a decision on February 18th in the matter of Cuddy Law Firm against New York City Department of Education, in which you filed, followed the 2010 precedent in Bloomberg and sent the case back for a hearing on burden. And I believe that has always been this department's, um, you know, directive when there is an issue of fact as to what has to be done for the agency to call the records. So I would ask at the very least that your honors follow um, the precedent set by the decision you put out less than a month ago. In Except here, I, 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 here, there's not that specificity. This is a very broad question, but you, you said you gave us two scenarios there, so. Yeah, but, 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 but the fact I was speaking to was that my adversary conceded to the fact that if they were given search terms that they could do a back end search. So I think then what it would come to is how many search terms are necessary to produce the documents responsive to the Jewish press's thing. Well, and how I, I think maybe it's first, where are the terms? Not how many terms, but where are the terms? That you didn't present any. Yes, that's correct, Your Honor, again, because our contention is that the rules very clearly say that if they have an issue in locating, they should reach out to the requester, not vice versa. But should it be remanded, the Jewish press would obviously be happy. I understand. I, anything else? Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Your Mr. Honor. Mr. Aaron, don't go anywhere. Next case is Jewish Press versus New York City Department of Investigation. Maybe you should change your tie. <laughs> Seriously, it's a marathon over here. It is. <laughs> okay. Now I see how you all feel. <laughs> okay. okay. Just a taste. You're just getting a taste. That's it. Go ahead. No, it's a lot to hold in one. Okay, so so Department of Investigation. So essentially, what happened here is, you know, there's been a lot of buzz about substantial equivalency and in investigations of yeshivas and yada yada yada. So the Jewish press obviously did a lot of coverage on this issue, and they wanted to see uh, 
you know, the investigation, once it was closed, they made a report. And essentially, the only thing they got was a four page summary that I believe was publicly released. You know, they appealed administratively. They invoked every decision in the book. They filed an Article 78. They lost. And here we are. What it seems like the case really comes down to is, you know, nobody's really saying that certain things wouldn't be properly withheld under FOIL. What it comes down to is a wholesale withholding of 1,400 pages, or no one even knows because they never even looked to see exactly what there was. So it seems like from the Court of Appeals, and there's been many cases on this issue, wholesale withholding is very rare, and essentially it happens in three occasions, mostly two. One is when you have Glomar. This clearly is not a Glomar case. The second is when it's all exempted by another statute, which emanated from this court and went to the Court of Appeals, NCLU against uh, NYPD under 87-2A. And the third one is like very rare when you have something like Lesher. Now, I think Lesher is really the guiding case to determine this appeal. Um, Lesher basically says that you could do a wholesale withholding, but you need what's called a particular justification for all the documents that are withheld. Now, in a case that was heard before this court in December, Judge Acosta went to great lengths explaining that particularized justification is a low burden, but it's a burden nonetheless. In the, right, Justice Scarpula was on that panel. Was on that panel, yes, I was. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's a low burden, but it's a burden nonetheless, and they have to show it. Now, here, there wasn't even an attempt to show that burden. They just said, you know, there's thousands of documents, and they're all exempt. Now, what's very interesting here is they gave half a dozen exemptions, maybe even eight. But the trial, the Supreme Court sustained two of those objections. Now, of the two objections sustained by the by the trial court, one was 87-2E1, which is interference. The Court of Appeals in Lesher said specifically that that exemption, by and large, is not applicable when you have a closed investigation. So, you know, I, I, I think that's... Um, that's that's pretty much um, that's pretty much it. And okay. then in terms, I'm sorry. Uh, finish, go ahead. Did you have something else? No, no, Your Honor. Oh, okay. It. So um, you have rebuttal. Uh, responded, Mr. Mc, Ms. McCampbell. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. Amy McCampbell on behalf of the respondent, Department of Investigation. Why Honor, don't we pick off uh, pick up where counsel left off? This is an investigation that's closed, right? So to the extent that it's closed. Why can't they have access to the documents, barring, of course, anything that falls within the exception of opinion or something like that? Uh, sure, Your Honor. So there's there's no case that holds that closed investigations are freely discoverable. And in fact, many cases recognize the opposite, that when there's a reason for concern about disclosure of investigative files, even in closed investigations, then that justifies the application of the law enforcement exemption. The Lesher v. Hines case recognized that if there's a circumstance that could justify- Well, uh, what's the circumstance here? Sure, so here, uh, Department of Investigation met the standard in Lesher v. Hines by uh, providing the generic categories of documents for which it was withholding and the generic risk of disclosure of these types of documents. And one of the risks that DOI uh, provided uh, of disclosure here would be that disclosure of this case file would disclose DOI's investigative techniques and methods, as well as disclose the uh, scope and the what nature. What is significant about your techniques or methods here? Sure. I mean, so yeah. this is an investigative case file. So it's, it's all of DOI's um, investigative plans, memoranda, draft reports. If that's the case, then what you would be saying is that any time a case was closed should never be able to get it because there are always investigative t techniques. It's the Department of Investigation. Well, Your Honor, the argument that these kind of risks could apply to other cases is one that Jewish press has, has made. But the fact that the risk could apply in other cases doesn't mean that they're not real risk that would justify withholding. Sorry, you think that every single document in your file is going to reveal some special investigative technique? That there's not a single one that you could produce? Even well, an email that says, let's meet on Thursday to discuss this issue? How could that possibly? I mean, and by the way, how could you make that blanket assertion like that? 
Isn't that exactly, I mean, isn't that exactly what FOIL requires you to do is actually somebody go through and make sure that not, that at least some of the documents can be produced? Sure, Your Honor. So here DOI again provided the categories of documents that were in the case file and explained that they were all exempt under one or both of, of two particular exemptions, a law enforcement exemption and the inter or interagency material exemption. Um, again, a lot of- And you think that that satisfies your burden under FOIL? Well, for the, the law enforcement exemption, Your Honor, it's the, the generic categories of documents need to be disclosed and the generic risk of disclosure. Uh, this court has recently recognized that it's an admittedly low burden for applying yes, the law. But you have to at least show something more than it was an investigation. I mean, especially when you're saying about unique investigatory practices. I mean, there are many, many agencies. How many unique practices and in investigation could there be? You interview witnesses, you, you know, you review documents. I mean, what kind of unique uh, practices are there that no one else knows about? Well, again, Your Honor, d disclosure of these these methods would, would cut against the law enforcement exemption uh, because it would interfere with law enforcement purposes. Another reason that DOI provided for withholding these documents is that it would frustrate, uh, potentially frustrate DOI's um, cooperation with prosecutors. Prosecutors rely on uh, DOI to partner with them in investigations and prosecutions. And if information that DOI collects is freely discoverable outside of the governing criminal procedure laws, then prosecutors may be less willing to work with DOI in the future. So there were several risks of disclosure here. Isn't, not that, just their, isn't that their role? Don't they have a, a statutory you know, requirement to, to prosecute and to, to, to exercise that role? I mean, they can't just choose. They don't want to do it. Sure, Your Honor, but there is a, a close partnership often with DOI and with prosecutors. And the concern is that uh, if the information that DOI obtains becomes freely discoverable outside of the criminal procedure laws, then that could threaten to interfere with law enforcement efforts. But what, I mean, we're talking about cases that are closed. If you have a closed case, but you have a piece of information that may be useful to DOI's investigatory purposes or practices in the future, okay, well, then that wouldn't be disclosed. But to the extent that there are things particular to just whatever the case is that would not be used in the future, why would that be uh, exempted? Again, Your Honor, revealing the, the scope and the nature of the material that DOI collected in its investigation would reveal a lot about how DOI's investigations operate. And much of this material is also exempt, again, under the inter and interagency material exemption because it's pre-decisional, well, deliberative. Well, yeah, so I'm sorry. Under that, if it's opinion, if it was something of that nature, of course. But let's assume that there's something in the first category that's not in the second category. Uh, it must Your be. Sure. Uh, this was an investigation that uh, DOI interviewed different city agencies and different uh, city employees. And uh, again, the, the interviews with these employees and the, the um, information that was obtained from them would all be internal, pre-decisional, deliberative documents as well. But Council, you can see how like just making that blanket assertion as to every single document in every single context would essentially mean that DOI would never have to produce any documents. That is, that's a pretty difficult position for you to be taken. I mean, literally, you've just said the entire file, no matter what, of every one of our investigations is covered by one of these two, two exemptions. And that's a very difficult position for you to be taken. Without any particularity, without any um, examination by the court, like an in-camera inspection. You're just saying every single one of our investigations in every single context, those two apply, therefore we should, because essentially that's what you're saying, that we should never get those documents because any of your investigations would conceivably co be covered by those two exemptions. I think a lot of the rationale for the law enforcement exemption can can apply in, in many different cases. And the fact that it applies here and could apply to other cases 
uh, doesn't mean that the concerns behind it are any less valid. Council, I know that you also, uh, you know, uh, claim that disclosure would, excuse me, identify confidential information. But here, was there any express promise of confidentiality here, or even or, or even implied? Uh, sure. So there's there's nothing in the record to indicate that. However, uh, the DOI records do note that there could be potential um, student confidential information in the file, as well as attorney client privilege information and attorney work product information. So even without an express promise of confidentiality, those particular uh, confidentiality concerns and, and um, privileges would still remain applicable. Okay, but that's still that that's a that's a carve out. That's a separate carve out. It's not the entire thing. Anyway, right. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Mr. Aaron. Yes, thanks. Just a couple quick points. So one is, um, in terms of the interagency, so as your honor just noted that those things would be redacted. Now, in terms of the techniques, the statute specifically says that routine techniques are never subject to the law enforcement exception. And here, from everything my adversary says, besides the fact that in the record, there's absolutely nothing that reflects we're talking about non-routine techniques. So well, that, she did use the word unique, which I asked about. Okay. But, I said I have, I'm very curious about what those unique practices are, but she said unique. Right, Your Honor. And, and, and then I just want to note, as Justice Kennedy pointed out, like in the Friedman case, it's so long as there's no specific promise of confidentiality, that that would not be um, applicable either. I, I just want to finish with also my client's petition was also for their costs and fees, which are subject to the 2017 amendment of FOIL, which no longer makes it discretionary, but mandatory um, you know, in, in, in cases where a petitioner substantially prevails and, and, and respondent had no reasonable basis to, to withhold, which clearly seems like the case here. Thank you. Again, thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. And Stick around, Mr. Aaron. The next case, Jewish <laughs> Press versus New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Okay. Thank you, Your Honors. So this case is interesting. It's technically a FOIL matter, but it's very interesting because it really doesn't have to do with any of the FOIL exemptions. What this case is about is about the statute of limitations. What happened was the Jewish press made a request um, they got some of the documents, some they didn't get. They appealed what they didn't get. And then um, they followed up six months later and commenced an action because they never got a response to the appeal. Now, under FOIL, um, the public officer's law, if there is no response to an appeal for 10 business days, that's deemed constructively denied. Now, in this case, the Jewish press's contention is the function of that uh, constructive denial is only one thing. It gives the petitioner the ability to commence an Article 78. So the question in this case is, when does the four months uh, statute of limitations, when does the clock start? So I, I it, and it, by the way, it's, it's really a case of first impression because the four cases cited by the trial court, none of them speak to the facts of a constructive denial in the context of this one. Now, my, our contention is CPLR 217 is, real, is, is, real, is really as clear as day, even without the case law. But with the case law, I, I don't see where any of the ambiguity is. What the CPLR says is that you have four months after you get a decision that's final and binding. So the, it, what's interesting here is the law department took the opposite position of the trial court judge in the decision they won. The trial court judge agreed that it's not final and binding, but said there's a separate rule for foils than every other Article 78. What the law department said in their papers is that a constructive denial is final and binding, but that foil is subject to regular rules under CPLR 217, which is very interesting. So I actually agree with the law department in that it's bound by 217, but I think the law department's contention that a constructive denial is final and binding is absurd. And I think that for two reasons. One is because in FOIL, once there's a constructive denial and somebody sues, they commence an Article 78, the agency has the ability to come back at any time and moot the proceeding except for the cost and fees portion. And that's been upheld by every department 
just within the last couple of years, and they all quote the third department, Cabado v. Benzinger of 2018. So it's very clear it's not final and binding. Um, the operative case with the Court of Appeals that explains final and binding is the uh, best payphones case, and it's either even further elaborated on by a third department case, I think selective services. So I'll just address the one point in the opposition that the city brought up. Typically, when there's no case law or anything else under FOIA, the rule of thumb is you look at the federal equivalent, you look at FOIA. Now, FOIA has a six-year statute of limitations, not, not, not four months. But the reason why I believe the city is wrong is because the Supreme Court said that statute of limitations start under federal law, federal statute of limitations, from the day you could go to court. That's when the clock starts to, to, to tick. Under the New York standard, it doesn't start when you can commence an action. The Court of Appeals explained specifically, based on CPLR 217, it starts when it's final and binding. So the standard of when the clock starts from the federal standard and the New York state standard is a separate animal. It's a totally separate barometer of yeah, when so you this start. Judge Carpula, when, when do you think a statute of limitations in general starts to run? In an Article 78? No, just in general, right? You have to have you have to have all of your elements. You have to have been aggrieved, right? And you have to be able to bring suit. So at the at the end of the 10 days, you're aggrieved because you were denied. And now for the first time you're able to bring suit. I mean, that's just general 217. You can read it in the original in those uh, McKinney comments to the right. So wouldn't that be when the statute of limitations starts to run? Doesn't that make sense? So it makes sense in the federal, but the way Court of Appeals in, in Best Payphones interprets final and binding is that you have something concrete and that they can't turn around and change their determination. So your honor is right under the federal standard and maybe under everything in New York except for, for a special proceeding under 217. But 217 is a different standard than everything else. I didn't research it, but under a plenary action, it may be the same standard as the federal law. But under 217, statutorily, it's not. You need final and binding. Now, I think intuitively we all know what finding, final and binding means, but if we don't, we have the case law to understand it. It means a concrete decision that the administrative agency can't come back the next day and change their mind. Okay. Well, aren't we supposed to take this 10 days at the end of the 10 days as concrete? And that's a decision. We're supposed to accept it as a decision. So whatever else went before, it's concrete and binding as of the end of that 10 day period in FOIL in particular. So the way I look at it, Your Honor, is that the legislature gave a petitioner or requester at that point the ability to seek judicial intervention so that they shouldn't have to wait forever to get the documents. It's not that they're required to. If you were required to, half the foils that agencies have would be wiped out tomorrow. I don't think that the legislature- Let me just interrupt you. Are you saying that you don't think a deemed denial is uh, sufficiently by, final and binding for you to go to court? How could you go to court? You're, I mean, how could you even possibly do that if you didn't have a final and binding decision? So that's a great question, Judge Scarpula. That's what I'm trying to explain. I think the legislature under the public officer's law did it just like, you know, if, it, if it, you could you could do a 78 to compel uh, a governmental employee to act. That's what it's equivalent to. Because You're saying you it inures to your benefit, to the correct. person seeking that's the FOIL, not to the benefit of the agency who the FOIL is being sought. That's to. absolutely correct. But just in terms of Judge Scarpula was saying, in terms of the final and binding, the way I started was with that case, Cabado versus Benzinger, Judge Scarpula, if it was final and binding, then the agency wouldn't have a right to then give another determination and move the action. They can't have it both ways. The fact that the agency has the right after you commence an action for constructive denial to then give on the merits a substantive determination is proof positive that it is not final and binding. Because if it was, no, no, there's, a, there's that anomaly. Then, if it's not final and binding under the CPLR, you don't have a claim. You don't have. You're not aggrieved if it's not final and binding. You have to be aggrieved. So, if you, I don't understand how it could be both. 
I agree with you 100%, which is why the legislature did this. They made an exception to the regular rule. I and mean, the legis- do you have some legislative history that would say that this is that's what it is? Because I don't see it that way. Let me just hear, Mr. Aaron, if you would finish your thought on that, because I think you've been interrupted. I just want to hear your complete thought. Make sure that I get it. Go ahead. No, no, my thought is like your honor said earlier, it's only to ignore a benefit for the requester to get the ball rolling, just like Article 78 is a mechanism in state law to compel any government employee to do anything. So you don't have to be prejudiced by sitting around waiting. But this idea that it functions as a double edged sword, not only doesn't it have any basis in anything, but the way the case law, I mean, I'll read from um, Matter of Selective Insurance that quotes the Court of Appeals, they say final and binding when an agency has reached a definitive position on the issue that inflicts actual concrete injury. The lack of a determination is not the same as a determination. It's not reaching a definitive position. That's my contention. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fletcher? Good afternoon. May it please the court, Kate Fletcher for the respondent, Department of Housing Preservation and Development. This court should affirm because the petition was filed more than four months after the constructive denial. The public officer's law is extremely clear that the failure to respond within 10 business days shall constitute a denial. It is mandatory language in that sense. And as a result, the denial and the denial Therefore, exhausts exhausts administrative remedies, and it is when the petitioner, in this case the FOIL requester, is aggrieved. And that is consistent with New York um, Court of Appeals case law that says that the statute of limitations begins to, is triggered when a petitioner is aggrieved, which is when there is a decision, a final decision that puts the petitioner on notice that administrative appeals have been exhausted. All of those aspects are here. We have a decision that enables a FOIL requester to go to court, it exhausts administrative remedies, and petitioner itself has admitted that it was aggrieved by the constructive denial. In fact, the petitioner in its petition states that the HPD's actions were final in nature. They had four months. There is no, um, while of course there is um, indications that FOIL should be interpreted in order to facilitate access to government records, the same sort of interpretive maxim does not apply to the statute of limitations under CPLR 217. The petitioner is essentially asking this court to extend the statute of limitations by deeming that upon the denial, the statute of limitations did not start to run. And while... um, Well, yes, he's saying that it endures. He's saying that that 10 days, since it's really an artificial um, sort of decision, um, that it endures to their benefit. It's for the, the person who has to who has requested the FOIL to be able to figure out whether they want to um, proceed with the Article 78, that well, there's no definitive starting date. I would suggest that because it is, um, they use the term shall, and they say it shall constitute a denial. This is not an optional situation. It doesn't say, for example, that it may be deemed a denial. It states very explicitly that it is a denial. And if it is a denial, then it triggers the statute of limitations. This is um, a very um, lopsided interpretation of the public officer's law to assume that the legislature intended to create a special carve out for the statute of limitations, which um, good public policy indicates, you know, for government purposes, there should be a short statute of limitation. This applies in all Article 78 situations. And um, and here, there's no exception to that. There's no reason that the statute of limitations hasn't begun to run. And the fact that following um, the petitioner's bringing in of an Article 78 in Cordoba, it was the court subsequently found that the um, action was mooted, 
does not go to the statute of limitations. The court did not say, oh, well, the petition was therefore premature because we now have a decision. They, it, wasn't, it doesn't bear on when the statute of limitations began to run. This is really a very simple situation where you have a denial, you have administrative remedies exhausted, you have the ability to go to court, and you have, a, and you have an aggrieved petitioner. All Thank of these. You. Um, just, you, Justice Shulman, did you want to ask a question? Yes. Okay. I, I, I would like to ask the question, if I may. Uh, Mr. Aaron raises the issue that, um, that the constructive denial doesn't really give a reason why you're, you didn't give some of the information. Like he stated earlier, you gave some during the July period, but you didn't give the balance of the information regarding the classification request they wanted. And mm -hmm. he, he, they filed their administrative appeals, 10 days of lapse, and the statute makes it clear that if he didn't get a response, it's, quote, deemed denial, denied. And let's accept that it's final and binding. But he still doesn't know why you didn't give him the rest of the stuff. I'm being colloquial, but you understand what I'm mm -hmm. saying. So now mm -hmm. here's the conundrum that he's raising. He'll file a new FOIA request and maybe ask for the same four documents now. So then the question is, then you won't give him those documents because, well, gee, you asked for it before, you exhausted your administrative remedies, we constructively denied it, the case is tossed because it's untimely, but you went on round one and lost. So this is the concern that he has here because they really don't have a reason why you didn't um, give him the documents except that the time ran. And then when you look at the earlier part of the statute, it says that usually an agency is required to give a written de determination that explains why XYZ is, is happening or not. And that hasn't happened here. You gave something earlier when Mr. Weinberg responded in the earlier round in July, but we don't have anything in August. And that's what his concern is here. So does that work at all here? Can, in other words, he, it's a conundrum that he's expressing here. Let's, let's accept for purposes of the discussion that the time ran and they're untimely. What happens the next round? Do, do you hear what I'm saying in terms of I the do, obligation? I believe, I believe I do, Your Honor. And I would point you to the Floyd decision by this court, which talked about where there was a petitioner who came and said that if somebody failed, if one of the agencies failed to respond, that they were required to therefore release the records. And the first department in that case said that the remedy that is um, appropriate when there is no response is to bring in Article 78. And I understand the concern, but the statute of limit, there was clear notice. Petitioner was aware of the constructive denial. Petitioner had four months. The petitioner waited beyond the four months. The fact that the petitioner did not um, bring this petition in a timely manner, I understand that it means that, you, that the petitioner may not get the information they are seeking in this particular instance. If, if HPD again denies and we have the same situation where they should bring the same request. But that doesn't, that is um, not directly on point of the fact that the the petitioner had an opportunity to bring in Article 78 to press those points and to press its objection to HPD's denial of its, of its administrative appeal. It had the opportunity. It did not avail itself of that opportunity in a timely manner. And just as any other statute of limitations, you're required to comply. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Aaron? Yes, thanks. I'd just like to make two points. One is I was going to bring up the case my adversary just brought up, because I think it's very important. In the record here, it shows the Jewish press had a litigation against HPD a year before for constructive denial. HPD said there's no such thing as constructive denial because the 10 days is, is not mandatory, rather it's directory, and cited this court, the first department, in matter of Floyd from 1982, and that's on page 13 of my brief. So it's very ironic because the same two parties, the HPD took the opposite position in that case than they're taking in this case. But I think it says much more than that because it shows how the first department 
understood the 10 days as directory and not mandatory. So I don't think anyone really understood this 10 day thing to be gospel in the sense that, you know, now, now the clock starts ticking for the, uh, for the four months. Thank you. Thank you both. And Mr. Aaron, you don't have to stick around anymore. Your marathon is over. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you your honors. Have a good day. You're welcome. Uh, U.S. Bank versus Stewart. Good afternoon, your honors. Andrew Bronstein of Locklord LLP on behalf of plaintiff respondent U.S. Bank Trust. Uh, as this court is no doubt aware, uh, the Court of Appeals very recently and after the parties in this case's briefs were submitted, issued a decision in Freedom Mortgage Corporation versus Angle, which makes it even clearer that the trial court here was correct in granting plaintiff respondent summary judgment. The court's decision in Angle made it abundantly clear that the trial court is not to look at the uh, the bank's intent in determining whether a deacceleration of a mortgage debt is pretextual. Uh, rather, the trial Counsel, court- what about the fact that there's a question about whether or not the person got the notice? The affidavits with regard to the notice, this is separate and apart from the recent Court of Appeals case, um, was done by someone who works somewhere uh, in the bank, a bank uh, administrator type. Your Honor, the um, on summary judgment, plaintiff respondents submitted an affidavit of mailing um, that was um, drafted and 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 executed by um, plaintiff's attorney at the time. Um, and the contemporaneous affidavit, um, it is it's well established that a contemporaneous affidavit of service establishes prima facie. Mr. Bronstein, uh, I'm sorry, yes. uh, Judge Shulman. I, are you referring to the affidavit of service of the deacceleration letter by counsel, separate from Mr. Manis' uh, affidavit, who was in-house, who was the loan person, who was describing by personal knowledge all the loan information, but could not give any personal knowledge uh, or experience with the mailing of the uh, RPPL 1304 notice. He just relied on business records. So I, I'm, I'm unclear that what you're referring to, sir. I apologize, Your Honor. I was referring to the notice of deacceleration. Um, if you so are that's not the issue here. The issue that uh, my learned colleague was raising is the the 90 day notice, which is the condition precedent. So the question becomes is, um, do you feel on this record, given that the person was describing business records, like his reference to business records, uh, it, it went from without having personal knowledge, without doing the mailings himself, um, do you follow what I'm saying, sir? So I do, and that, I apologize. That could be a gap for, here. That's okay. And I apologize for misunderstanding the question. Uh, the affidavit that was submitted here uh, does explain that the affiant does have personal knowledge of uh, Caliber, who is the servicer, in fact, for the plaintiff here's uh, standard office practices and procedures. Um, and but that's not enough. It, well, I should say, is that enough to satisfy our very specific notice requirements for 90-day notice? Uh, I but believe it is, Your Honor. I believe it is, Your Honor. Uh, courts have routinely held that a a description um, by a person with knowledge of those standard office practices and procedures, explaining the office practices and procedures um, for addressing and mailing the notices, um, and saying that they were followed to mail the notices uh, in at issue. Sim simply it, stating that, simply stating we prepared, we addressed, we this. That's not the same as discussing the office procedures and ensuring that the thing was mailed. Well, Your Honor, there's an extensive um, description of the office practices and procedures, which uh, does explain that. Well, it doesn't matter if you have something that describes it. It matters what was sworn to. Correct. And and the anyway, why don't you wrap up? Because you only had two minutes. Uh, I think sure, I've given Honor. you that already. Uh, in addition to the description of the practices and procedures and the testimony that those were followed in addressing and mailing um, the notices, the actual notices themselves uh, were attached, um, which included the certified mailing barcodes on them. Um, and in response, defendant and appellant included uh, nothing other than a, a purely conclusory denial of receipt uh, of those Thank notices. You. 
Thank, Thank you, you very much. And you get the marathon award also, especially <laughs> since you have to wait till the very last yes. <laughs> bit in, on your own. So your case concludes arguments for today. Court is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You too.